Notice of, of joint public meeting of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville and the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee. Pursuant to Chapter 551, Title V of the Texas Government Code, the Texas Open Meetings Act notice is hereby given that the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, Texas, in accordance with Article 5, Section 12 of the Charter of said city, will convene a special joint workshop with the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee on Tuesday, May the 8th, 2007 at 5 p.m. in the Commission Chambers on the second floor of the Brownsville City Hall Federal Building. Located at 1001 East Elizabeth Street, Brownsville, Cameron County, Texas. Is your mic on? All right, if everybody would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I know I'm going to tell them. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one and indivisible. Do we have anybody here for the invocation? All right, if not, Commissioner Longoria, if you please leave. bow our heads. As we give thanks, thanks for this wonderful day, we ask the Lord to look upon us and that his blessings may be amongst us as we go into this workshop and that we look very carefully at the decisions that we're about to make, that they be made in the best interest of the city and its people as we begin to prepare for a future, not just for us, but for our children. And we ask for continued blessings, Lord, for wonderful weather, and for all our wonderful citizens. In this we pray, amen. Amen. All right. Mayor. You may uh, be seated. Mayor, and members of the commission, may I just make a kind of a reminder note to myself as well as everyone else that this is a, a governmental meeting that because of the highly uh, political nature of these issues, I would just uh, remind everyone that it's not a political forum, it's just a workshop, that it's not a public hearing, and that, uh, especially in, uh, with the proximity of the election at hand, we need to be very careful to not make statements that would um, tend to in any way uh, support or oppose any political candidate or any political issue because that would be electioneering and that's prohibited by the state election Thank code. Thank you, Pat. Item A. Item A, discussion regarding the findings of the consultant hired for the impact fee study. All right, uh, Mr. Medina. Before you is the uh, capital advisory, uh, the capital, the citizens advisory, um, the 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 wrong committee. capital improvements advisory the committee, committee uh, for the city. Uh, I'd like to welcome <coughs> Sia, a new member to the uh, committee. For the benefit of the viewing audience, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and the other members of your committee, please. Do you have a microphone? Where's their mic? Right there. Uh, the only mic on the table is uh, Mr. Snow. Well, it's, it's for purposes of the, it, we don't want anybody complaining that anybody got muted on purpose. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Vela. I'm chairman of the Capital Improvements Advisory uh, Committee. I would like to introduce the, uh, the members of this committee, Mr. Michael Garza, Mr. Richard Zayas, Mr. Mark Bernard, Mr. Pato Mada, Mr. Ruben Garcia, and Ms. Leanne Greer. I'd like to welcome our guest today, uh, Mr. Jeff Snowden of Economists.com. All right. All right, Mr. Snowden. Uh, before we begin, could you all check your mics? Testing. Test. Test. Right. Test. Four years Test. we never had a problem. Now we do. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Snowden. <clears throat> Can you give him a mic? Yeah, give him yeah, a mic, he, please. He can't hear you. He needs a mic. He's got it. Move it up. Test. 
Turn it on. Mine's still not working. Try it. Charlie stepping on the wire. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor and members of the commission, members of the kayak and the t all in attendance. It's my pleasure to be here today and be of service to the city of Brownsville and the Brownsville PUB. Uh, glad to be here today to discuss our initial findings of the impact fee study that we were engaged to prepare. And um, I'm glad to answer any questions throughout the course of the presentation. We do have prepared statements that we'd like to get through, but uh, the intention is to make this a work session and answer questions, and uh, I'm here to do that, and uh, look forward to any questions from anyone in attendance. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I will be going through that was on the screen. Uh, before I get to that, though, I'm gonna be uh, talking about what an impact fee is here in the state of Texas, and uh, what we put together in order to define an impact fee is a, a nine-step model in Excel of uh, based on a small system, based on uh, some modest capital improvements, and uh, I think it's an effective tool to define what an impact fee is and what the credits are, et cetera. So, let's try this. Ah, I see. So in this example, and I hope everyone can see the screen. Y'all dim the lights a little bit, please. In this example, we have a hypothetical system with a thousand, with a thousand acres in the service area. And as you can see, from a period of 2007 to 2017, it's not expected to grow. So we've got a finite planning area. Uh, our planning period, again, is 10 years. In this example, we're assuming that the, the utility will go from 1,000 connections to 1,200 for a net addition of 200 connections. And the basic question is, if you're adding 200 connections, all of, is, all of which is being driven by growth, how can you allocate the costs associated with serving those 200 connections in a way that's equitable and in compliance with Chapter 395 here in Texas? Well, we do that by first looking at the average demands on the system which in this example is about 350 gallons a day. We use a peak day factor to get to the peak day because when you design treatment facilities, you have to use a peak day. That gets us to 500 gallons even. So we've got 1,000 connections needing 500 gallons a piece, and we know we're gonna go up to 1,200 connections in the next 10 years. That means we're going to go from needing 500,000 gallons of treatment capacity per day this year to 600,000 gallons for a netted increase of 100,000 gallons over the next 10 years. This is just putting it in the terminology of MGD, million gallons a day. So let's quantify that incremental capacity of adding 100,000 gallons to the system. You can see in this example that instead of adding 100,000 gallons, the utility has added 300,000 gallons. They've gone from 0.5 to 0.8 for a net increase of 0.3. Now, why would a utility elect to build capacity greater than a 10-year need? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. Economies of scale, you might have a contractor that sells a package plant that only comes in 0.3 MGD increments. Uh, might be the decision of the management of the utility to overbuild in anticipation of growth. For whatever reason, in this example, the utility is elected to add 0.3 MGD to its treatment at a cost of $100,000, $100,000, excuse me. 
So let's go to step five. We're already at step five out of a nine step process. Real quick, you mentioned connections. Connection fees have nothing to do with impact fees. Exactly right, Commissioner. Because we've been told, I know I, I talked to Commissioner Ernie Hernandez before when he was here, and he made everybody believe that connection fees were the same as impact fees. Just for the record, it's not, right? Absolutely right. Okay. Uh, for Thank the record, some, some communities that have connection fees that in place that don't have impact fees in place have a capacity okay. component in there. Go ahead. But it's not a legal connection fee. A, a connection fee should only recover the cost to buy the meter, set it, send the crew out to the field, break pavement, et cetera. Yep. And that's it. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so we're, al we're allocating the cost of this $100,000 capacity expansion. And again, we know that for the next 10 years, we need a 100,000 gallons increase. So that means 33% of the cost can go to that 10 year planning period growth. 67% has to be borne by someone else. And in this case, it's existing rate payers. And that's, a, that's a, a key concept. To the extent that you overbuild capacity, there's only two places that can be borne financially. Either the 10 year planning period growth be an impact fee or the current rate payers. That's straight out of Chapter 395. What is that? That's uh, the enabling legislation for impact fees here in the state of Texas, the local government code. So it limits the, the actual statute limits the, the charge to the, the developer what you charge to the community? Absolutely. That's right. And that's a key concept. Um, so in this example, again, a third of the 100,000 can go to it, be an impact fee. The remainder has to be borne by the current rate payers slash other system revenues. Of this, to the extent the system generates interest earnings on investments, connection fees collected, et cetera, they can also offset those costs with that. Let me ask you something. Yes, sir. If the rate payer is paying 66%, and right now with our impact fee at 280, the developers aren't paying at 33%. It's more like 97. 97% is paid by the rate payer right now. I'm asking a question. Well, people need to understand. I want to understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, am I right or not, though? Well, there's no corollary in this hypothetical example in the current situation, but I do intend to address your, your question directly, Commissioner. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so we've allocated the cost of this $100,000, and we've decided that 33333 can be allocated to the 10-year planning period growth, the 200 new connections that we talked about originally. So our next step is to, is to calculate the pre-credit maximum impact fee. Three, nine, chapter 395 allows us to also recover the cost of debt. So in this case, we got a 3.5% origination fee. That's eligible for re recovering an impact fee. That goes, that takes our 33,000 to 345. There's also the ability to recover the net present value of interest associated with debt if you finance the growth of the debt. In this case, we're assuming that over 10 years, you're gonna accrue $10,179 in interest charges on this debt. And those are real numbers based on 5.5% uh, financing over 10 years. So that adds another 10,179, which gets us to a total of 44,679 that can be recovered in an impact fee divided by the 200 new connections that we've forecast to come online gives us a pre-credit maximum impact fee of $223 per new connection. Now what's a credit? That's the next thing. The whole concept behind the credit is that the utility is only going to assess monthly charges based on one rate structure. You're not going to have one rate structure for your current customers and one for growth. So again, we, we talked about before that $66,000 of this cost is not impact fee eligible. That means we've got to adjust the current rate structure to incorporate that debt service. So let's look at that. We've got $69,000, that's the current rate payers portion with interest. Financed over 25 years at 5% gives you a monthly payment of $403 divided by the 1,000 current connections gives you 40 cents a month impact on your current rate payers. And keep in mind that that impact's gonna also be reflected in the statements that go out to your new customers because you're only using one rate structure. So let's go to step eight. We determine the rate credit. 
We know in the 10-year planning period there's 120 months. Now, we're, we're going to use a very simplified assumption here and assume that all 200 new connections come online in month one. That's never the case, and the model that, it, that we use for these accommodates the timing of the new connection. But for simplified reasons, we're going to go, we're going to assume that they all come online on month one. That means for 119 months, every one of them will get a monthly bill for water service that incorporates, that includes 40 cents for capacity that they've already paid through an impact fee. So that means over the 40, the 40 cents times the number of months, 119, means every one of those new connections will pay 48 bucks total over the 10 years out of their rates for this new, for this new addition of capacity. We got it times the 200 connections gives you $9,600. So we got to net that out because you can't charge development twice. So we get to the final step. We figured earlier that 44,679 is their total cost with origination fees and present value of interest. We take out the 9,600, which we just decided they're going to pay over the 10 years in rates. Gives us a net amount of 35,079 divided by 200 gives you a maximum impact fee net of a rate credit of $175. That in a nutshell is what an impact fee is. And I'm going to stop because uh, I, I'm glad to answer any questions. It is an example. It's a hyper simplified example, but I think it's uh, a good tool to develop the base understanding and then and build from that. Is that the only way to calculate the impact fee? Uh, that is for new capacity. Now there, there's also a case, and this is the same example, where the system could have had 800,000 gallons already in capacity. In that case, we wouldn't have incurred $100,000 in new cost. We would have looked at what that original cost would have been, netted out accumulated depreciation, netted out any contributions in aid of construction by developers, and netted out the receipt of any grant proceeds. And in that net amount, we could have then done, went through the same exercise and recovered through an impact fee as well. In the case of uh, PUB, I think we're going to do both. I think in many cases, we're going to, the impact fee is going to be recovering investments that have already been made. And in other cases, it's going to be recovering investments that have to be made to provide the capacity for growth. Uh, I'm going to move on to the PowerPoint. Uh, we're certainly able to come back to, to this you need to. Um, our objectives, of course, are to develop uh, understanding of the impact fees, uh, discuss our current findings and the status of the project, and uh, develop a procedure for data collection and verification of my assumptions and findings, and uh, establish the dialogue to get, us for, to get us done with this thing and give you all a tool to recover costs from growth, which I think is the overriding objective. Uh, impact fee is a tool, um, and when you do it right and you incorporate all the players, it, when you finally get to the number, it's pretty undisputable about what that number is and what, what it incorporates. And I would say that we're about 80% complete with providing you that tool. And uh, I'm uh, really looking forward to wrapping this engagement up to the satisfaction of everyone involved. And of course, we'd like to agree on the next steps. What is an impact fee? It's a one-time charge paid by new development to finance the construction of public facilities needed to serve it. Um, when you implement an impact fee, you do mitigate the financial impact of new development on existing ratepayers, no doubt about it. An impact fee does uh, offset pressures on your current rate base. Um, the revenues from impact fees are very restricted by the Texas law. They have to go into reserve accounts and can only be used to construct the capital improvements that have been identified in the CIP, the capital improvement plan that's been reviewed, subject to a period of public comment, and formally adopted by the governing body. Um, it's, this study is far more than an economic analysis. Uh, we have to provide a process by which you can arrive at an acceptable fee. Uh, I think that we're well into that process. and. Uh, we're wide open to suggestions if you feel like we need to uh, modify our approach because every city's different. But I will say that 
the approach that we use and that we've developed over time has been very effective in communities throughout the United States. And uh, we hope to have the same outcome here in Brownsville. Uh, we're here to conduct workshops and meetings with all the stakeholders and to examine the policy implications of the impact fee alternatives. And our goal, again, is to arrive at a consensus among all the parties. Other issues to examine, which are part of our scope, uh, rate impact of the different impact fee alternatives. Is there an amount of capital improvement funding that you can do over the next five to 10 years that would actually be neutral, that could be 100% recoverable by, recoverable by an impact fee and have zero impact on your rates as they are today? We can identify that for you, yes. There is a level of CIP. Um, is there, uh, we need to discuss the sensitivity of impact fees to increases or decreases in rates of growth. Very important. Um, the potential negative impact of fees and also the negative economic consequences of a lack of capacity. Everybody talks about, well, if you impact fees too high, then you're not going to have growth, well, and that's going to hurt the overall economy. The flip side is if you don't have the capacity in place, if you don't have that much sewage treatment, elevated storage on the water, ground storage, et cetera, that can also hurt economic growth because it's going to go to where the capacity is available. Uh, the primary inputs of the study, of course, are the land use plan. That tells us how big your service area is and the rate it's growing and the direction the growth is heading. Um, capital improvement plan, which is even more important. Here's what we need to construct over the planning period, and here's the amount of money it's going to cost. The assumptions about how the capital improvement plan is financed, as we just saw in the example, if you've got fees associated with selling debt and interest, that's recoverable. We need to be aware of those so we provide you with a full picture so that you can then make the decision on how much of that picture you'd like to recover. And then also, because of the rapid growth in Brownsville, and I would classify your growth as rapid based on the 17 years of history I've, I've reviewed, it's important to review these assumptions and calculations every two to three years. State law says every five years, when you're growing as quickly as Brownsville is, it's advisable to consider a more accelerated uh, review period. And I want to repeat that state law requires that you update your impact fee every five years. I know there's been some discussion about, well, we did a study in 90, now we're doing another study that accomplishes the same thing, et cetera. Well, you, you, by law, you need to review these every five years. I would recommend a 10-year planning period to be reviewed every five years, mainly because of the economies of scale associated with building these type of infrastructure assets. It's hard to, to go out and sell debt to build five years worth of sewage treatment capacity or five years worth of elevated storage. That's why the 10 years is more appropriate. But by law, you have to come back every five and make sure you're on track. To the extent that that capacity doesn't address all the needs over the next 10 years, absolutely. And, and, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about the capacity provided by most of the CIP. Some of it I have not been able to detect what the capacity associated with the line item is, but the majority I have, and I can talk so about the that. The land use assumption plan, from my perspective, the only thing that I think needs to change on that at this point in time is the rate of growth. Um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the land use assumption of pr uh, assumed a 5% per annum compound growth rate. I think your history demonstrates that you're growing at about 4%. That doesn't sound like a whole lot until you apply it over a 10-year period. Uh, other than that, I think the land use assumption is acceptable, al although I'd certainly ideally like to flesh it out and really get specific about densities in, in land uses. Uh, and I've got a slide on that coming up. The CIP, though, the modification of the CIP, I think, is warranted based on a few items that I'm going to address in the next few slides. No, go right ahead, sir. He, he needs a mic. The audience and the TV aren't going to hear you. No, no. Like, on the replay, won't pick you up. People at home are. Okay. 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 The 
primary issue on the impact fees is to what extent should the cost of growth be paid for by existing ratepayers or by future development? The city has the right to set impact fee at any amount from zero up to the maximum identified in the study and that other credit that I just discussed. If the impact fee is set at a maximum, then council, in this case commission, must consider the potential negative impact of the fee on growth. And the, if the impact fee is set at less than the maximum, the financial plan that comes as part of the study should accommodate those revenue shortfalls so that you have the funds necessary to pay for all the capital improvements when you add up rate revenue plus impact fee revenue. The equation is simple. Your total, cap total capital outlays for this planning period are going to be borne by the combination of rate revenues and impact fee revenues. One of them goes down, the other one's going to need to go up. So this last, excuse me real quick. So if the impact fee is set at less than maximum, monthly user rates must be higher to make up the difference. If in a, yes, sir. With a fixed capital improvement plan, in this case of 130 some odd million dollars, if you're on the hook to build 130 million dollars worth of improvements in the next five years or 10, you've got to you've got to get it done with one of the two pockets of money. And to the extent that the one dwindles, the other one's got to come up. So it'd be safe to say that because we've been at 280 for all these seven, last 17 years, that according to the model and according to what you're telling me, ratepayers have been subsidizing what has not been paid in the impact fee since it has not been increased. I think that the, what I've seen of the system, you've got a tremendous amount of overcapacity that I think has been funded by a, com a combination of rates that are high relative to the region and to the state. And then also, you have to incorporate the contributions of native construction that the development community has provided, which are not impact fees, but they are cash contributions that have aided the system. So you can't not talk about those when you talk about the history of the funding. So when you have a basically a community that's had rates being increased over the last 17 years without an increase in the impact fee, safe to say that those ratepayers have been subsidizing that, correct? I think the, the combination of rate revenues and contributions have certainly put your system in a situation where you have a lot of overcapacity. And uh, the, the ratepayers certainly deserve credit for that, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Excuse now, me, what are the contributions you're referring to when you say ratepayers and contributions? There's a, there's a couple of different mechanisms available to utilities to build infrastructure. <coughs> uh, Impact fees are one, and the other one are developer-specific exactions, where a developer <coughs> approaches a utility on, for a project, and the utility says, in order to do this, uh, we're going to need for you to build this amount of infrastructure and donate it to the utility. That's a developer-specific exaction that's recorded on the ledger of the utility, and uh, it's not an impact fee, but it basically serves the same function to provide capacity to accommodate growth. Yes, ma'am. Jeff, Mr. Now, Smoke. sorry, Mr. Lara. Uh, Go Jeff, ahead, Mayor. Uh, one quick question. The perception, though, that if the impact fee was much higher at the maximum allowable rate, then in turn rates would go down. There would be no increase in rates, period. <coughs> because here, we, here we're saying that because of the impact fees, we know <coughs> rates have gone up. But consequently, if rate, if impact fees were high, much higher, then rates would be lower. We would lower. We'd be able to lower rates. Do you no, agree sir. with that? I, no, I, that I don't agree with that because your current rate structure is based on a fixed operating and maintenance cost structure <coughs> and a fixed debt structure that's not going away anytime soon. The utility's got combined water and wastewater annual debt service between nine and a half to ten million dollars through 2017. So a higher impact fee doesn't mean lower rates. The, rate rate. the bed's made at this point in time. <coughs> That's what I was gonna and it's not going to change because you incorporate a higher impact fee. What certainly would change is the amount of future debt you would have to sell to pay for the growth. Just a matter of time. Let me ask it this sure. way, Mr. Snow. Yeah, I, um, go ahead. This goes, or what's happened is the direct <coughs> result of the fact that the city and PUB were not updating and reviewing the, um, the CIP in a five-year plan like we should have been. Had that been going on, the adjustments to both the rates and or impact fee would have been able to do because we're in a position of planning for the CIP, developing and planning for the CIP for the next five, 10 years uh, incremental. 
Is that right? Is that a, is that a fair That's a fair statement, statement and uh, that's my fault. Well, no. Everything I mean, that, sh that should have been done in the past, I I'll take the blame for it. I really want to get past uh, so-and-so didn't do no, the no, job. No, no, no. We need, we need, so we need, no. Out, I'm the but we need to understand, we need to understand that that's, we, these are the cards we've been dealt. Yeah. And because we hadn't addressed this, this is, this is a reality of it. It's not to cast a thing, uh, blame or, or point a finger, but we, we have to know that we didn't necessarily have a full deck when we started this, but okay, we know what we're missing and we're trying to, we're trying to get caught up. I agree with that, Mr. Right. Mayor, absolutely. Mr. Let, let me ask you something real quick. Let let me, ahead, if I may, Jeff, real quick. I think what uh, Commissioner Camarillo was trying to allude to is that we've been told that by adopting the Black and Beach um, maximum impact fee and the, Black, and the Black and Beach construction plan that our rates would go down from our current rates. Would you agree with that? No, sir, I wouldn't, and uh, I, I, I'm going to skip ahead to uh, some but numbers. On well, we did just, I, we just drop I, rates, though. No, what, what I'm getting at is, what I was going to ask is this. Okay, we're, we're hearing that, you know, the rates aren't going to drop. But rates aren't going to drop because we're 17 years behind where our rate payers have been paying for what that impact fee should have been paying. Had that impact fee been raised every five years, like you said, somebody somewhere down the line dropped the ball. Had those impact fees continue to be going up, you know, right now we won't be able to lower the rate because we're still paying for 17 years worth of rates of impact fee rates not going up. Oh. So it's, it's not because we're going to find a magic number. We're still trying to catch up. Yeah. Well, it's, not, it's not a situation it's, of catching up, per <clears throat> se. It's a realization of the lack of planning that we did. That's right. In 16 years, from 1990 to 2006, we spent 90 million. 91 million, right? 91 million, 376,000. 91 million in capital uh, improvement projects. Now, now they're trying to tell us that in the next five years, we're going to spend 138 or 134. No, 84 million direct uh, attributed directly to new development. Well, initially, but but I, but the 134 CIP, million. The CIP was for for 134 million, 84 of it eligible for uh, for impact fee uh, related. Re impact fee related. The the problem, and that also includes an estimated 15,000 new ESUs over the next five years. No, 20,000. I think it was 20,500. Over ESUs. five years. Over five years. Now. As I understand it, over the last five oh, yes. years that we that the city's been experiencing arguably the largest growth that we've ever had, we've been averaging about twelve or thirteen hundred uh, ESUs a year. Eddie, that was a number that I was given back in the fall when I asked the, the question. The numbers that, that were estimated was was coming out well. I thought it was 15,000. I guess the, the estimate, the average would actually be a larger number than that if it's 20,000 over five years. It'd be 4,000 instead of 3,000. But, but you have to take into account that uh, some versus some commercial properties use more ESUs and they're <coughs> accounted for as a unit. I understand. My mm -hmm. understanding was the estimate, what we've experienced over the last, I'm sorry. It's about 2,000 new ESUs on the Over the last side. five years? Per, per annum over the last Okay, so, so, so the years. estimate was calling for double the growth anticipated that we had not been experiencing that over the last five years, we've experienced the most growth we've ever had in this city. My point has been, I don't understand how we need, why we need so much uh, capital improvement over the next five years that we've not done over the last 16 years, and you're predicting, or there was a prediction of growth that over the last five years we had an experience. So we were looking at double the phenomenal growth that we've had over the last five years, therefore necessitating the need for new, uh, for new capacity. Again, and I want to make it clear, and I, and I think Mr. Snowden, I reviewed your, 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 uh, your PowerPoint and, and the information. I don't think anybody should shy away from having more information to make an informed decision. Whatever that number is, I've never quarreled whether it's high or low. I had my concerns, but this is the first time we've done it. I think the next time is obviously gonna be, the commission will be better informed and be more okay. familiar with the process, as will everybody involved. <coughs> so, But I, I think 
uh, you, you, you don't, your, your goal here is to provide information? Is it, is it to, to set an impact fee at a low or high amount? Was anybody, was that, was that your goal, Mr. Snowden? No, sir. Well, did not, anybody not tell you, guy, we want you to find a low impact fee? No, sir. Not if we want to continue in this business practicing consult <laughs> impact fee. Yeah. Right. We, need to, we need to be unbiased, and we, and we will be unbiased. Okay. Yes. That's and I think we all agree that, that we do got to raise the number and the impact fee, and I think, uh, Mr. Snowden, you're going to be able to help us um, come up with that number. I think you mentioned it earlier that it'll be a, a number that'll be neutral, rate neutral, so where we can set the impact fee at a higher amount yet not have to raise the rates. Yes, sir. And I want to talk about, well, first I want to give the floor to Mr. Omada. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, City Commissioner. Uh, this is not the first time we do this. This is the third time we do it for a purpose of correction. And I disagree with Mr. Snowden saying that uh, uh, rates are not affected and rates are not lowered because in the past, uh, since 1994, we've had 11 rate increases in water and wastewater. And if you eliminate those increases, if they never came before the commission, we'd have lower rates, bottom line. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir. Okay. I so then we would. Wait a second. Let me. Let, 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 let me. Let, let me. I want to make sure we're clear. So you're saying if we not had rate increases, we'd have lower rates right now. What I'm saying is that if we did what we were supposed to have done in 1990, when we adopted the land use assumption, we adopted the capital improvements, and we funded the the, uh, the uh, capital improvements as it was proposed with the 2133, you wouldn't have had a need to have the rate increases because you would have had an oversight committee to tell you, hey, you need to lower the impact fee or, or, or raise it uh, to meet growth. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Stone? If, if you would have implemented $2,100 in 1990, I think it's safe it, to say that the level, the degree of rate increases since then would probably have been smaller, yes, sir. Smaller or none? Because, well, because I, you have an oversight committee that can say, okay, let's adjust the impact fee up or let's adjust it down to cover the cost of capital improvements. Just due to the fact that the law states that impact fee revenue cannot be used to yeah. pay operations and maintenance and you've had the Definitely. effect of inflation over the 17 years, you would probably have had to raise rates over okay. the, that For time the, period. But it depends on how much. That's what we were told <laughs> last let, time. Let, let me finish. I mean, you know, this, I'm not here to debate, but what I'm saying is we're talking about capital improvements related to growth, Mr. Snowden. We're not talking about any other stuff. We're talking about capital improvements related to growth. If we would had done what we were charged with in 1990, adopted a rate, and overseeing that rate, the capital improvements, the land use assumptions, you could monitor it up or down to, to uh, mitigate any rate increase related to new growth and impact fees. Is that I, right? I agree with that, okay. absolutely. Okay, so, that, that's, so then we agree that the rates would have been lower. Because of that, if you had done that that way. Okay, so let's, let's be very clear on that. Now, DSUs, very good question, Mayor, about DSUs, that they're kind of optimistic. And, and the kayak committee, for most of you that were not here back then, but uh, Leanne Greer can attest to this, and I'm sure the chairman can attest to this. We discussed the, the amount of ESUs, and we all agreed that they were optimistic. But the reason they were optimistic, we looked at, at the optimistic side, knowing that we would have a way and the checks and balance to oversee that if the uh, if the if the uh, uh, projections are not met, the kayak committee would then oversee and lower it or raise it because these are just projections. They're just projections. Okay, it's not engraved in stone, but it has a way to monitor it. If the growth is there or if it's not there, then you you don't do the capital improvements that you projected, and you would adjust the impact fee. Is that right, Mrs. Uh, Greer? Okay, is that right, Mr. Chairman? Okay, so there was a, a way to, uh, the, the 3,090 was not engraved in stone, okay? Now, uh, the economic analysis that Mr. Snowden is talking about, shouldn't it take it into account the demographics, the per capita income, the cost of homes, the unemployment, the proximity to Mexico, disposable income, population age, disposable income, cost of utilities, and all that, I mean, should, should, should the economic analysis take that into account? Do you have a copy of his report, Mr. Miles? Yes, sir. Okay, I okay. thought some of that information is included. No, in but, but I mean, to do a cano economic analysis as far, I didn't see some of this stuff like the cost of utilities and the unemployment and all that stuff. I didn't see that. Okay, so I'm wondering, 
if the charge was when I was here uh, before you all decided to hire an economist, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Atkinson, the charge was to keep rates down and the impact it would have on the industry, the impact fee. Is that right, Mr. Yes. Okay. That was a charge. So now I'm hearing, and I think it's a matter of your opinion, because you're not an engineer, you're not an expert in impact fees, you're an economist, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. But you're I an can economist. multiply. Yeah, I understand, but I mean, your, 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 your expertise, your expertise is being an economist, not an engineer okay, hold, hold or economist. Hold on a second, Mr. Mala, hold on a second. Yes. You, you started off this by saying you weren't going to debate. No, I'm not, but no, I'm, I'm, you are. I'm trying to understand. No, no, I'm not. I'm trying no, to understand no. where we're going with this well, okay, then because this is finish. this has evolved into into not an it, uh, an impact fee. Uh, I mean, an econ economist study, but an engineering study, redoing the, the study. That's what I I'm, I'm hearing here. Did, did the Black and Veatch uh, uh, study take into those things that you just mentioned into consideration? We didn't hire him as it an economist. Right. We hired him as an impact fee Correct. based, based on, on the land use assumption provided by the city Correct. and the capital improvements provided by PUB and the discussions we had publicly with the CAIA committee, the city commission, and the public. Okay, the so that's why it's important now, that we have an economist. But we didn't, we, that was not our scope of work. Sorry. But that's what he's saying. He wants him to do those things he's saying, not come up with all this other stuff. Well, the question is how much do we want to grow? Okay. The question is how much let's, we want to grow. I understand. Let's, okay. if, if you have a question, Mr. Mala, I don't mind that. But if not, let's let Mr. Stone continue with the Okay, the question is, the way the engin engineering study was done, okay, the met methodology and the analysis. We can disagree with maybe with the amount of growth. We can disagree with the amount of capital improvements. And we can disagree with those little factors you point out. I'm not an expert, okay? but. Doesn't that have a mechanism to protect developers and ratepayers through the CAIA committee to oversee this impact fee and adjust it up or down? Does it have that mechanism, yes or no? Uh, I'm sorry, does, can you does, repeat the does question, what please? Have, um, does the does Black and Beach report, okay, based on the land use and uh, uh, capital improvements and all that, does it have a mechanism to oversee the projections, okay, to adjust the impact fee based on those projections, whether they're fulfilled or not, to adjust the impact fee and keep rates down. Does it have that mechanism? No, it does not. Through the CAIA committee, you can't oversee well, this? Uh, uh, we're, supposed to, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to oversee this and monitor it no, as recommended? No, it's certainly within the power of this body to but do that. But wasn't that the but recommendation? that was not enumerated in the Black and Beach study at all. No, there's but that was established by the body here, the commission and, yeah, and the CAIA committee. the responsibility okay. yeah. of the body. It wasn't yeah, established. But it was yet. not in the Black and Beach study. It wasn't. Real quick, it Mr. Bernard, I just, I just want to say something real quick. Just to respond to Mr. Camarillo, he says that more than likely we may have to raise rates even if we drop the impact fee. I understand that because we saw that with Mr. Leandro from PUB had it up here. Commissioner, I never said that we would raise rates. Or, or you, we'll, so look, well, let me let me ref let me tell you what I did say. What I said was, if we had a high impact fee, the high impact fee was was implemented. Yeah. Does that mean that rates, in turn, would go down? That's what I said. So let me correct you. Okay. So even though in, fi in 2009, Camarillo, we're going to have to raise rates as per these guys going to New York, getting the bond. They're, they're, they're holding us to uh, in 2009 to raise the rates. How much depends on where the impact fee is. Do we want to raise it $4 or do you want to raise it $0.10? Cents? Yes, you're right. We may have to raise rates or, or maybe not do nothing. But in 2009, it's going to come about to where how much we're going to do. PUB did that presentation, and they said, "Yeah, you did, no one's disputing that. It's just how much do you want to raise the rates in 2009 when these bond people come back down and say, hey, look, this is what you were supposed to do.' Commissioner, no, what I'm talking about is going on, back to what on, the hold mayor. On, hold on, Commissioner. Well, talking oh, to him. No, no, you, you, again, you're misstating the fact. There has to be a commitment from this body with regard to issues of revenue. When a bondholder lends money to this city or to PUB, they want to make sure that they're going to get paid back. Okay. And, what, and the city has to understand those responsibilities to those bondholders. Okay. And if you don't pay your debt back, guess what? It screws up your credit rating. Well, I totally agree. All right. Well, I, I understand. So you're, so I, I you're no, let me, let me, let me finish. But there has been no commitment by this city or by PUB to raise rates. What the plan of finance called for 
is that in the event that rates were needed, that's something that has to be addressed in order to pay the debt. Exactly. But if the growth is there sufficient to pay the debt without incurring any additional rate increases, then guess what? You don't have to have any rate increases. So you made an assumption in the statement without, again, trying to misinform. Well, maybe, you're doing it, maybe you're doing it unintentionally. No, I'm basing it on what the, the presentation was. He's right here. Bring him up. Who's right here? Leandro from PUV. I'm not disputing okay. that that's what it said. Commissioner, what I'm telling you is that there's no commitment. That's what the plan of finance, but if the growth, we were also supposed to raise it, we made a commitment, they wanted us to make, ra make a commitment to raise the rate for the next five years. Where's Leandro? Who's with is that, that not right? And we said we'd only agree to a one year. And the growth so far, and the growth so far has been sufficient that there's been not, a, that the need hasn't been created that we have to go back and revisit that situation so far. But if, but if we have three down years or two down years or one down year, and PUB says, you know what, our finances aren't looking as good as we anticipated. Guess what? They're going to come back to this city commission, and they're going to say, in order to meet our obligations, operation, maintenance, and debt, we need to do X. That's just the way it works. And to try to say that it's not, that's not going to happen or that won't happen is unfair and it's misleading. All right. Mark, unless did you have a question? I had three comments back of related okay, to Okay, you know what, I, inter I interrupted Commissioner Camarillo. I wanted to make sure that that point was made. Sorry, Dan. Point was made, Mr. Bernard, go ahead. Okay. Uh, if we look at the first example that Jeff gave us, showing how a rate, wor how a uh, impact fee is created, or what it looks like, that only picked up 33% of the 100%. Because the way you have to build these monsters, the sewer plants, the water plants, the infrastructure, you're not gonna just build exactly what you need, you're gonna have to overbuild. So the ratepayers will absorb that difference because by law we can't add it to the impact fee. So there's no getting around that unless we do substandard uh, development of new, of new uh, infrastructure. The other thing too is if you look 17 years ago, our, those water and sewer rates only have doubled in that 17 year period. How did we, were we able to hold them down that much? When I talked to uh, John Brusiak last meeting, he said that we had EPA grants available to us, whether all other forms of public finance were available to do ex plant expansions, et cetera, which he says has dried up now. I believe there are still alternative public finance vehicles that we will get into later as we go down this study road. And um, so then the, the, the thing that I think we'll get into as uh, Jeff continues to unfold his, his presentation is the need, is the capacity and the need thereof. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, there needs to be a correction. Uh, the statute 395 is, is referred to by Jackson Beach. It says we must comply with Jackson Beach with the section 395. That's a deep source there. Okay. And that section 395 says dictates that we have a committee to oversee the impact fee. Is that okay. right? So and then it is, in essence, saying what I just said up there, that there is a mechanism to oversee the impact fee. The impact fee. Based on section 395, the Black and Beach recommends we buy. Okay. Sure. Nobody disputes that. Yeah, so nobody disputes that. It was, it was not part of the Black and Beach report. But there certainly was a no, reference to no, chapter no, 395. So, yeah, I agree with I, I agree yeah, with Mr. Omar. Um, what uh, what the mayor discussed earlier is key when you start talking about debt issuances. And before I get too far, I'm going to say that I'll be making some statements today, and I would defer to your financial advisors for any follow-up questions on this because these are real critical um, and Estrada and also can answer these more fully but I have reviewed your bond ordinances and official statements and uh, I think it's critical that everyone understand the impact of the constraints you're under right now with your bond issues which aren't out, which aren't out of the ordinary at all um, and to understand them within the context of the capital improvement plan as it was presented in the original plan um, Original plan called for a, a growth of 14,778 new water units, 13,672 new sewer units. If you multiply that times the maximum fee, you get total impact fee revenue over the five years of 19.7 water, 23.9 sewer, for a total of 43,724,000. The plan called for a total of $128 million in capital improvements. 128 
134, it just depends what you look at. I, I duplicated the figures and didn't round up, and that's the difference. Um, so that means if you're collecting 43 in impact fee revenue, and you're going to construct, and you're on the hook because you have developed a capital improvement plan, you've submitted it for public review, and you've formally adopted it as a body, you're on the hook to build $128 million worth of capital improvements over the next five years. That means you're going to need to come up with $84.3 million. How can you want to do Well, you've uh, went out, you've developed a capital improvement plan, you've uh, gone through a 30-day public review and comment period by Chapter 395, then you've adopted it and made that a part of the impact fee. And when you go through that process, the law has you go through that for a reason, because when you de design an impact fee, you're basically committing to the development community that those improvements will be there in the time frame stated in the plan, so that then the developer can use that for his planning and cash flow financing, et cetera. And, and is that money available, or is that money that would need to be borrowed? Well, in this case, Mr. we've got, Mr. yes. Mr. Snowden, may I ask you a question just to clarify one thing? This, this is real numbers, right? This is not an example. These are the numbers from the CIP, yes, what, sir. What I want to clarify, out of the $128 million that is part of the current CIP, which is a cap, capital improvement plan, plan, right? Yes, sir. The, the spend of $128 million. Out of that $128 million, you will only be able to raise $43 million from, from impact fees? That's right. The maximum number provided so times the number of service units to come How do you 40, 43 out of the 128 is impact fee eligible? Is impact fee, is anticipated impact fee revenue, yes, sir. Okay. So in, in other words, the developers through the impact fees will only pay $43 million. Is over that a simplified the, version of that? Over the next five years, that is correct if you collect all of it and those number of new units come online during okay, the well, Okay, well, okay, hold, hold, hold on, Mr. Science. So at $43 million, what's what's the impact fee? Is that at the max? That's at $3,090. Okay. Right. Okay. 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 okay, and so where does the other $84 million come from? The a other $84 That's million dollars has to come from ratepayers. So if you, no put the, if you put the max and you, and you if the city... Based on the capital if improvement this, plan. If this, you're saying that the city commits to put a, three, a, 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 yes. an impact fee of 3090 right. and adopt the whole $128 million, the rate payers are going to have to absorb $84 million? $84.3 million needs to be raised in order to finance the capital improvements. Some of that might be able to come from interest earnings, some of it from non-rate revenues like connection fees. The majority will have to come from rate revenues, which, are, which account for the vast majority of revenues to the system. So what does that happen, what, what happens to rates? Well, in rough numbers, $84 million financed over 25 years at 5.5% results in an annual debt service of $6.2 million divided by 6.2 million a year? $6.2 million a year divided by the number of current connections you got on the system is 129 a year per connection divided by 12 is $10.75 per month. Added to the 65 a month, your, your rate payers pay. So how much percentage, water. how much percent rate increase it's is about that? about a 16% hike. So the rates will have to go 16% hike if, Over if, the next five years. If you adopt the 3,090 impact fee. But right now if, we went if, back down to 280. If we go back. Now that we're at 280, Rick, this is what I want to tell you. Now that we're at 280, it's not, hold, hold on, hold it's on not 84 second. million. It's it hold, 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 hold on, turn. plan. I just want to get it clear. If the city goes ahead and adopts the 128 million capital improvements, that means that the city is agreeing to build 128 million dollars of capital improvements. That's the city is now. The city has that kind of cash. The PUB has that kind of cash. Where does the cash come from? I'll, I'll defer to PUB's financial team on that. Okay. But let me ask you something real quick, Rick. Hold on, hold on, hold on who, a second. Who who drives the CIP? Who says this is what we want in the next five, ten years? Developers, right? No, PUB no. does. PUB. Well, PUB works with developers to see what they want as far as growth in the next five, ten years. Yes or no? I don't. I don't. Yes, they, work. they do. I don't wait that. a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Who's Eddie? Who's here? Yeah. John's not yeah. here, is he? Yeah, that's yeah. Eddie. He's here. So, so Commissioner Atkinson is, is saying that the reason you have a hundred and twenty-eight million in capital improvements is because you, PUB, went out and listened to the developers, and this is what the developers wanted. 
Is that right? There's a whole lot of in here that is I, I understand that. No, I want to make sure. No, let me tell you. The just C, if the CIP first, first, just answer that I'll question. Answer the question. Well, I is, the CI, is, is the CIP based upon what the developers tell you that they want, the or is this based upon the what? The capital improvement plan was prepared by Brownsville Public Utilities Board, and it has various aspects into it. Part of that could very well be the growth projections, the anticipated projects. We certainly know what projects are coming online because developers have submitted information. It isn't solely driven by information gathered by developers. A uh, part of that may very well be. I mean, that's part of the planning process. But the th there's another thing too on this, and and, and you know, we, we, we've already gone through a lot of this stuff. If you recall, initially, when the CIP was presented, and Leandro is here. If, if you have any specific questions, but if you assume that we were going to implement that plan. It had, the way you financed it was three ways. There was that portion that was the impact fee. There was that portion that was gonna be generated incremental growth by the system as it grew. And then there was a piece that you were gonna have to debt finance. It isn't the entire 84 million that you're gonna have to debt finance. And then if you recall, you asked us to prepare four different scenarios. And at each of those scenarios, those pies shifted whether you were going to have to borrow more money, borrow less money, bigger impact fee, smaller. So, so there's a lot all of that, variables all into was, this. All that was with the assumption that you were sticking to the yeah. same number, that being 134, 128, yeah. whatever that CIP yeah. list the, was. The, the, I'll make another comment about Is that right, Eddie? If we were to do that, those numbers were driven off that CIP. Right. You that had is a, correct. You had a total amount. And, and it was driven off of the, whatever the maximum allowable you was. You had a total amount. That's and correct. And you figured out. If you, if you stick at nothing, you go to the max, and then we had our scenario. But it was That's all correct. based upon the fact that the driving force was we have a capacity need or a capa CIP of 134 million at the time, 84 of it, 85 of it being uh, capacity related. Right? Yes. Okay. If you stick to that scenario. I mean, now, that, that you have to have a number, yeah. a, a whole $100, okay. and then you use that to divide it into how the four different right. scenarios that you did. And, and if you begin to change the numbers, then the scenario begins to Absolutely. change. Absolutely, okay. So, uh, but, but yes, if, if you recall, all of those scenarios were predicated, if, if you did this based on these numbers, this is what would occur. And then there was multiple scenarios that, again, affected those, those pieces of the pie depending on how much was gonna be generated through the system or impact fees or how much debt you were gonna have to incur. Okay. Uh, I'll Jeff, just Jeff, real quick, real yes, quick, sir. since you know numbers, at three thousand ninety, since we're not paying three thousand ninety, we're paying two thousand, you know, two hundred eighty dollars. What does that? What does it do to the total IF revenue? Oh, total CIP. What is no? What does it do to the difference to be funded from rates? Uh, just so the people at home can know and understand what's going on. If you don't have 3,090, we're at 280 right now. What does that do to the difference to be funded from rates? It goes up. It's common sense, right? Right. So that's what puts us at 90%. It does. If we, did, if we did that CIP plan. If, if we stick to that okay, but let me ask you something. This is the question and, I asked. And, and if you have that growth. Yes, and this is what I asked can I, can PUB. I put a tag, hold, can I put a tag on that yeah. response, Mr. Commissioner? Based on the premise that you need all the capacity associated with 128 million dollars Yes. yes. Okay. Very big assumption. But oh, but you but then you're going to come up with well because the south plant is at 45 percent, so we can divert some of the wastewater water back to the to the south plant. That's what you're saying, right? But oh. did you ever come to think that you need to put lift lift stations? You're going to have to go through downtown Brownsville underneath. And did you know that PUB already told us that that's going to cost 20 million as opposed to the 24 million for the new wastewater plant? So it's still the same. Well, you can't you can't say well, I'm going to put a couple of oranges from the north plant to the south plant. You can't do that without changing you infrastructure. You're, you're asking okay. him questions about information that he hasn't yet presented. Let him finish his report, and then you can make your assumptions and try to do well, your arguments that you've been answers. working on. Let him finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. And I want to. If you know the answer, then don't ask the question. And so I people to at home need to know, Eddie. Mayor, for the you purpose of clarification, the 3,090, please. I think everybody needs to understand because Mr. Rick Zayas is new, okay? Uh, Mr. Zayas, the 3,090 is not the magic number. 
because if you want for development to pay for itself, then you would have to raise it, what, $14,000 per ESU or whatever. Wait a second, wait a second. Get the mic. Whatever, I'm, I'm just using a number, okay? You have to raise it a lot more than 3090 right, Mr. Chair? If, if development, d development attributed directly to the impact fee, you have a way to raise it more than the 3090 The 3090 came into account, whatever the number is, was to keep rates down. So that was 33% of the cost of the 84 million. No. 3,090 no. was, was the maximum allowable. Yeah. It was the maximum so allowable. So you cannot raise more. Because, okay. are you sure, Rick? I stand corrected. I stand corrected. You and sure? Not, and, and so Rick? The reason he's asking that is because of the debt issue. Okay. Me and you. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's why. And I brought that to the attention that if we include the debt, it would go up. That's correct. That's so correct. I mean, I, it is allowed. That, that's, that's what I was trying to point but, out. But, but that's not even clear either, right? Because it still doesn't have in the 2009, there's not a credit calculated in there. There's a plus and a minus. Mr. O'Malley hit on the plus, which is you, you are el allowed to incorporate the origination costs and the net present value of interest if you debt finance it. On the negative side, you also have to remove the amount of revenue that will be generated through rates from these new connections expected to come online. And does the statute talk about anything with regards to what you can charge if you haven't done the rate credit calculation? Yes, it does. So what does it say? The statute indicates that it gives you two options. You can calculate a credit representing the amount of revenue raised by rates and ad valorem taxes. Some utilities also generate or pay CIP with ad valorem taxes. You can go through the process of developing a plan to identify that amount of revenue or you can divide by two. Do you know that credit's been done? It was calculated in the Black and Beach report. Uh, I uh, do not believe that it was done. I think it was done to the extent that existing capacity was uh, part of the equation, but the new capacity, no, it wasn't done. So, uh, then, so then by statute right now, we couldn't even charge the 3090 without that calculation. In other words, we can only charge 1550 Is that correct? I haven't done that math. It would be, be the half of the 3090 well, it, yes, but you'd also have to incorporate the net present value in, of the interest in the origination fee okay. associated. But yeah, I did want to finish this example because this is key. So you may want you may need to go back a little bit since we haven't interrupted you enough. Okay, no, I don't I don't mind. I'm glad to answer questions. What we went through determining that about 84 million needs to be funded from something other than impact fee revenue which equates to $10.75 a month add-on for rates. But what we didn't talk about was operations and maintenance. What is it going to cost the system to operate and maintain each fiscal year new sewage plant, new transmission lines, new lift stations, et cetera, et cetera, because the law is very clear that 0% of O&M is eligible for recovery be an impact fee, and that's critical. What that means is to the extent that you can maximize the investments you've already made and that you're already paying O&M on and minimize the new stuff you want to build that you might not need, you're minimizing the impact on your ratepayers. And I really want to stress that. Well, let me ask you something. Yes, sir. On the North Plant, if we expand and PUB doesn't have to hire operations and maintenance on it, that, that, that helps too, right? Absolutely. Not having to raise the Absolutely. The I, think, I think that uh, if you expanded it, and I was reading in your rating documents that it is scalable is what they call it, up to an additional 10 MGD, that would certainly resolve, uh, help to resolve the question. I think it wouldn't be an O&M neutral approach. You would have to probably incur more electricity, chemicals, and probably bring on new operators. But it would you know, certainly beat the cost of operating a brand new 5 MGD plant with a whole new footprint. Talk on the mic, Pat, so I can hear you. Who would be best qualified to make those kind of decisions as to what capital improvements we need? Because uh, prior to some of these new members here, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Greer or Chairman, it was brought to our attention different scenarios. 
to build a new plant, which was the last uh, option, and to upgrade the existing north plant or to uh, transport sewage to the south plant, which has more capacity. After the presentation that was made to the kayak committee, it was going to cost $24 million to upgrade, to, to transport uh, sewage for collection points and lift stations and everything to, to transport sewage to the south plant. And it was also pointed out to, to the kayak committee that to add capacity to the north plant, we would be limited based on, this, on the space that we have. And with the EPA regulations coming down, being more strict and all that, when we looked at cost of 25 million for a new plant versus transporting sewage to the south plant, or expanding uh, the a limited expansion on the north plant, which would require another uh, a, a new plant anyway in five years, you know, if we looked down the head, even if we were to expand the north plant, based on the cost of 25 million for a new plant versus 24 million for transporting, and I forget what the cost was for the expansion there, it was decided based on the recommendations of the experts, the engineers, PUB, and the kayak committee to go with the new plant. But who, in your opinion, would be best to make those kind of decisions? Because obviously you have an opinion, they may be right, and may be wrong, but I mean, who would be best? I mean, you don't have the numbers of what it costs to expand the new plant. You don't have the numbers what it costs to transport the sewage to the south. So who would be best to, to make those kind of decisions? I think the engineering staff of PUB and their external consultants would probably be ideally suited to make those decisions. And uh, the recommendation I, I made last week, and uh, we did hear quite a bit of response, but we never heard that there was an alternative uh, for $24 million on conveyance. So I'm glad that that's already been explored because last week we didn't hear that. But the recommendation that I made was that when you do look at those alternatives, that you, you, you apply a life cycle cost analysis to it because it's not just about the cost to build it up front, it's about the cost to operate over 20, 25 years. And as we said earlier, and I'll keep repeating, any new O&M comes straight to the ratepayers. You can't recapture it with an impact fee. So you want to minimize O&M going forward if you're really focused on uh, maintaining the rates as they are and not increasing them. So you, you're, you're, you're saying it'd be best by the experts, which are the engineers that have to deal with I, this? Yes, sir, Mr. O'Malley, I agree. Thank Absolutely. you. Yes, sir. What, what? We uh, discussed this issue last week at length. At the kayak yes, meeting? Yes, sir, regarding the 5 MGD expansion, which... The uh, entire kayak committee was there? I believe just about all of them were there. Well, Maybe. Well, okay. Yeah, we we had... Uh, did we have a quorum? I guess we did. Yes, sir. I think you had the chairman, and we were the only one from the original kayak committee. Okay, so... This yeah. is a kayak now, right? And, and this, is a, this is a kayak committee now. And, and we, right? we jumped ahead to the sewage discussion, and it's, and it's important for everyone to understand what we're talking about. We've got 22.8 million gallons a day of sewage capacity on the ground. Say it again. 22.8 million gallons a day of sewage treatment capacity. That's what we have. That's what you that's have. What we have capacity right now. That's right. How much of that are the we most you've ever used on average is 13. <laughs> now, PUB is that is valuing the cost of new sewage capacity at five bucks a gallon. That means 22.8 minus 13, anybody? 7.8 times five, $38 million. $38 million worth of capacity is not being used. The question that I raise, what I, which I think is reasonable, is why spend another 25 million when you got 38 that you're not using? And you asked that question? I certainly did, yes, sir. What uh, I think that we agreed that we would look into it and explore it further, that uh, I, I uh, raised an issue that they'd already looked at, but would be glad to. Is that how it was looked at, Mr. Mata, when you were? Originally, uh, originally it was looked at, it was decided based on what I said earlier. We're looking at, we, you're going to have growth, growth to the east anyway. So the south plant is going to service that new growth eventually. But the cost of collecting and transporting sewage from the north to the south was too costly. It was not cost effective. That's why it was looked that way. But, okay, that when you asked that question, it showed me, was that the, I mean, it, I was, it, no, no, I understand that. And, and that answer makes sense to me. But was that what was said last week at the meeting? 
No, I didn't get that response, and I, I haven't gotten anything with respect to wastewater engineering that's more recent than uh, 2002. So if there was further studies done that supports that, I, I would certainly like to incorporate those into my documentation. But the only thing I have on wastewater engineering capacity, et cetera, dates back to 2002 and the water wastewater master plan that was do, do, prepared. Do the numbers indicate to you, you said right now the most we've ever used is 13 million. Uh, currently, that's the high right now. That's what's, what's the average right now? The, that, sorry, Mr. Mayor, the average is 13 million gallons a day. Yes, sir. What's the highest? And, and we have that. Let's talk about that. Right, that's, 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 that's a good distinction. Yes, sir. Um, we, we've got that here in this slide. I'll looking for that real quick. On the $22 million, a $22 million gallon additional capacity that we still have, mm -hmm. does that mean that we can't charge one nickel of the $25 million plant to the, in the impact fee? It sure does. I don't see any way where you can assess one nickel of the $25 million as part of the impact fee, and I'll uh, go through that calculation. Are you talking about statutorily? statutorily, absolutely, based on the capacity statutorily. per connection. Uh, here's, Mr. Mayor, here's your, the response to your question. Um, here's South Wastewater Treatment Plant with 12.8 MGD. Here's your average use of that, anywhere from 5.3 to 5.5 over a 13-year period. The South Wastewater Treatment Plant with 12.8 million gallons a day capacity, you're using between basically five and a half of that on average basis. Now the Robindale plant with 10 MGD capacity started off at five, went to six in 02. And uh, in 05, 06, this is the fiscal year, you use 7.1. Now TCEQ, out of 10, yes sir. Now TCEQ says, and I might not have this exactly right, but I believe TCEQ mandates that when you hit 70% utilization on an average basis, you must start planning and designing for an expansion. When you hit 90%, you must award a contract for that expansion and start constructing. Well, let's do let's do some numbers here, and uh, I'm going to let you answer that question or anyone else. You have to start planning additional capacity. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to plan for an additional plant. Of course, you have to get and and well, let me let me ask this question: out. When you when you add both, you you mm -hmm. add both plants to get your total capacity, and then you add both uses to get your percentage usage. Is that right? That is right. Okay. That's one approach. The other approach, which I saw with San Antonio Water System, is uh, they had the very same issue, and what they elected to do were for an impact fee is assess one impact fee at a lower level for any development within a certain diameter of the existing treatment, and then a higher impact fee Zone for development impact. outside of that diameter. That's another approach, but, and I think that addresses the key issue here because you don't have a treatment capacity deficit. You have a conveyance deficit. You had a transmission of wastewater deficit. Uh, I want to answer Mr. Zias's question. This, this comes straight out of the 2006 impact fee study. You had, according to that study, your average wastewater ESU requires 244 gallons per day of treatment capacity. You have, per that study, 52,358 current ESUs, and they forecast that you would add 13,672 more over the five years. Get you to 66,030 service units times 244 gallons a day. This is multiplication. This isn't high engineering. Equals 16,111,000 gallons of required sewage capa treatment capacity. You got 22.8. Well, that's what we're saying, but most of the growth is at the north. So it's going to go to the north plant, not the south plant. I concede the point. That's engineering. I concede the point, Commissioner. And uh, to the extent that you elect to resolve a, a conveyance issue with treatment, you can certainly do that. But it would, it would, you would certainly want to look at a zoned impact fee well, because you can't assess. That's what we should have paid the yeah. study for, a yeah. zone like what he wanted. Yeah. I have a question of PUB. Why did we oversize the southmost uh, plant 
and how did we finance it? Southmost plant was oversized because it needed to be oversized. I mean, when was it? When was it? Uh, when was I know that, that I think that it was done in two phases. The last phase was completed in 1999. First now, phase? I also know the first phase, I'm not sure. I, I know that it was, uh, Jeff, you may have because you've looked at the data. I, I, it was increased to 12.8 from what I believe around eight. I think it had like I four so. or five million gallons of treatment capacity added to it and because that was, and it that was, was added in 99. The, the final phase was done in 99. Now, how it, was, how it was financed, I know that there was, uh, I think there was a water development uh, board loan in that because I think, uh, or, or so, some kind of a loan, a as well as some debt issue to finance the balance of that. So uh, it, 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 w it did have a combination of, of, of revenue, but in both cases it was debt because if it's a loan versus, you know, bond, it's still debt. And right now, it's and, and great. Well, and but yeah. Well, the thing with the thing with that plant is that that's it. You can't do anything else with it. it and what it's about going the north plant? Now, the north plant, I, I, I can't address uh, when it was built or, or whether it's even had an uh, uh, an extension because I just simply don't have the institutional knowledge. I, I do know that uh, that's a 10 million gallon plant, as, as stated. And the rate of growth on the north is on a much more accelerated than it is at the south plant. Uh, you d yes, you do have combined capacity. And, and let me just make one comment to, to, to Jeff's point about uh, the last kayak meeting. Uh, while the discussions about how we got from, uh, from expansion or diverting flows to the south to a new plant wasn't discussed in detail, it was discussed. And in fact, um, when the kayak first began to look at the capital improvement plan presented by PUB, the first element of that scenario was to divert flows to the south treatment plant. And we looked at projects. Uh, the second scenario was to actually look at expanding the north treatment plant. As a res and then really the final scenario was to look at building a new plant. Now all that discussion went into finally arriving at a decision to let's build a new plant. So it, it, you can't just say that it was never looked at or if it was never discussed because it was. Uh, um, it, essentially, it, it began by, by looking at all of those scenarios. What I recall was that when we began to look at diverting those flows, I mean, you've got some pretty long distances from the north and where that incremental growth is, ex is rapidly uh, occurring to the south plant, you were looking at some pretty major capital projects to the tune of 20 to 25 million if instead, you did that. Instead of building <coughs> Instead plant. of building or even instead of expanding because even if you expanded, you were still going to have to divert flows to, 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 to uh, meet that. Uh, so, I mean, all those scenarios were looked at. Uh, what, what didn't happen at the last kayak meeting was they certainly were not looked at in detail. I mean, I, I think th if you're going to begin to change the assumptions under which the initial study was done, you're going to have to go back and look at how those assumptions will affect the calculation of a new maximum allowable. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but if you begin to do that, if you, if you change the assumptions in the land use, if you change the CIP, then you have new numbers. You still have to go through the process of determining what the new maximum allowable is. That may or may not solve your problem about whether it's going to be 3,000 or 5,000. You may find out that it's going to go up. You know, the issue is you're still going to have to set that fee at some point. I mean, we know that since we presented this uh, study and all of the discussion, there has even been a new element added to it. We've been told by our board, just as we've been told by the city commission, is that no CIP is going to have any kind of debt that requires rates. Well, then you're going to have to look at your new CIP because you're not going to have 138 million or 135 or possibly even 120. You may only have $60 million to work with. So you're going to have to redo the CIP. If you begin to look, even if you change the growth from five to four, incrementally, Mayor, it wasn't based on 5,000 ESUs per year. It was more like 
anywhere from 25 to 2,800 ESUs per year over that five-year period. The, the uh, only point I want to make on that is that we have not experienced that growth what? in the past, and we're not close to it now. That's why I have I have real concerns with that projection. Uh, you you on average it's been four. You've had some years when it's been lower. You've had some years when it's over. Your ESU conversion at some points may have been 1,800. At other points it may have been 2,800. Uh, all we're saying, all I'm saying is that if you begin to change those, then you're going to have to go back and look at it. Also, you know, th th there, there is the issue of credit, and, and we haven't had a chance to really sit down and agree or to, to look at how uh, Jeff's interpretation uh, with, with Black and Beach's interpretation. Plus, Jeff's introduced some new elements to it that we did not include in that, and that is you can include the cost of debt if you're going to recover that as part of impact fees. We didn't. You can also go back and possibly include some recovery of some past capital improvements that you've made. And if I'm hearing you correctly, some of those may be eligible for impact fee recovery, which we did not do. So if you're going to change the landscape or the assumptions, you're going to have to go back and redo this. And what you get back may not be the maximum allowable that you're looking for. It will put you in the same dilemma. You're still going to have to decide whether you set where between zero and what that maximum allowable number is, you're going to set the impact fee. And the, the last thing I'd like to say is that we are not implementing the CIP as adopted by the CAIAC or the City Commission or our board simply because we don't have the financing to implement it. So we're not moving on those projects, Jeff. And that's real simple. We don't have the money. We're not going to do them. So does that hurt growth? Eddie, and I point it hasn't because those a lot of those projects were going to be you know in year two and three and four and five and at this point you know we're dealing with what we've got on the table. But but eventually, we're going to be will. looking at that incremental growth in the future. That's why I think we all agree that this process needs to be concluded and we need to move quickly because you are going to have to deal with that growth whether it's over the next five years or the next ten years and have some anticipation of what projects and how you're going to fund them. Yep. I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. We're not going. We're not executing on that CIP because we don't have the resources to execute it. And then, and the, because you know. Well, get the well mic. again. Rick, if if, if you the know, there, there's a big difference between if, if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna execute a plan based on you're gonna recover you know two thousand dollars worth of, of 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 impact fee versus one that you're recovering two eighty. It's gonna have a substantial difference of how much you can be able to do. Especially if you add the scenario that don't come to us with something that says we got to go out and borrow money that has an impact on rates because we're not gonna approve it. So how are you gonna do it? And I think the important thing here that this commission, at least myself, is, that I'm trying to do is not raise the rates and, and that we We're come up with a rate that. neutral. That's, our, that's already given. Yeah, a rate that's neutral not, number. That that's about. real important. Rick, what was your question? Because I didn't hear you. Do you, you want to get to the mic? Can you go to the mic? Go to the mic. Mike. Rick. Go to the mic. Not Mike. Yeah, get the answer again. It was a good answer. Eddie had a good I, answer. I needed a clarification. Is, is it PUB's? Uh, position is that they don't plan to execute execute on the hundred twenty eight million dollar CIP. Not at the present time. No. Okay, and if they don't plan Except to do the that, market. then how we as an we as a kayak are trying to get to a number of an impact fee, right? The three thousand ninety is dependent on a hundred twenty eight million dollar CIP, right? So in other words, we have to know what PUB plans to execute on in order for us to tell the commission, okay, this is what we think the impact fee should be because you would agree with me that we have to have that ultimate CIP number in order to come up with an impact fee that would be uh, attributable yeah. to that, right? and, and my comment to that was if you're going to begin to change the assumptions, yes, I would agree that you really need to do the CIP again as well as you need to do the land use assumptions. Excuse me. Uh, the, the, the other, the other point, too, is that um, – you know, because of the variables have changed. So consequently, it's not constant anymore. Now, 
395 is pretty clear on how you go about it. You know, one of the things I want to make clear is that it isn't the kayak's responsibility to do the CIP. You know, it's the PUB's responsibility to do the CIP. We bring it to you. You have the opportunity to question it. You have the opportunity to, you know, ask for info. And you have the opportunity to, you know, make whatever written comments you wish to forward to the city commission as it relates to the CIP. But it's not Jeff's job or it isn't your job to do the CIP. That's PUB's job. Well, I think what we're hearing today from Jeff, and I think, and, and I would agree that you do have to go back and relook at it because you are changing to some degree the landscape on it. You, you've come up with some things that are not included. You've also had him raise some questions that are included. Uh, you've also changed the growth projections. You've also suggested other things. I mean, if you're going to look at zonal rates and so forth, you know, you be, you begin to kind of almost talk about redoing the process. And so if, if, if we're going to have to redo that, you're not in a position to recommend, I believe. But my understanding of what he was supposed to give you is some semblance of what a number could be that might not have a negative impact yes. on growth, not exactly. what the impact fee number or the maximum allowable should be. Again, if, if you change those scenarios, you may come back and find out that the maximum allowable number is going to go up. I, I agree with it is going to and, go and, and it is your statement, it, Mr. Well, it, it, and, and I have to disagree with something you said earlier, and I, I, I'm hesitant because I've got great respect and admiration for you and PUB as a whole. Mm -hmm. But um, with respect to your earlier comment that the original figure did not include historical sunk costs, it did, both for water and wastewater. That, that was a big component of the 3,090, and. Uh, I don't recall. Uh, repeat that again, please. The uh, original study did incorporate the study. did incorporate the recovery of uh, historical sunk cost for infrastructure already in place, not just new stuff. That was part of their no, no. Well, part of it. Uh, right. I, I, okay. Definitely part of it. Okay. But it, the, the but other it, part on the financing part was not included. And correct, absolutely correct. The other the other observation I want to make is. is is key, and I think Rick hit this on the head. As we go through this process, uh, there was uh, discussion about what what is ecommerce.com doing? What did they get hired to do? Our scope was very clear. Uh, we were asked to review land use assumptions, then the capital improvement plan, then recommend a fee based net of a credit, and then talk about economic implications. We always started from scratch. We we, we were always clear that we're not here to critique an existing study. We're going to start from scratch and do it the way we always do our studies, from scratch. And, and that's what we've done. And I've, I've said this before, we're about 80% done. So we're not, when you talk about starting over, we started over about three months ago. And we're close. All we need to do is get over the hump, get the last bit of data, and then give you guys a number to work with that I think that the majority of the players can agree to. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that PUB would like the opportunity to review and digest your study before you tell us what our number is, and we just got it, saw it for the last first time uh, on Monday. So that's what we're doing, Eddie, going I'm, through that I'm process. Not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take a cheap shot at you. Just please don't ask for another study after this study. <laughs> no. A study of this study, because what, what, what I'm talking about is that that's fair you, you you have to, you, you, there is a way of recalculating what the maximum allowable is. That's all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about reinventing it all over again. But if you make some assumption changes, then your original assumptions are no longer valid. And so consequently, the denominators or the numerators that go into the formula change, and you just run it again and say, OK, here is what your new maximum allowable is based on these assumptions that you now have made. That's all I'm saying. I'm not by any means suggesting that we need to start all over and, and, and read from the beginning. Uh, but but, but there, if, if you do change those, then you, you, you do or it is my opinion that you would recalculate the maximum allowable, and, 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 and then that will change. Eddie, and I think you and I are on the same boat where statistically you and I know both that that number will come back higher. It, and well, you, you don't know. I said, I said it's conceivable. You'd have to go through the process of looking at it. 
to, to determine whether it will be higher or not. It depends uh, on the assumptions. Commissioner, I'll say that a lot of that depends on the historical cost, what you originally paid for a lot of your excess capacity, net of depreciation, net of grants, and debt? net of debt. Uh, debt? No, sir. Net of uh, depreciation, but you net of grants, that, right? and net of contributions in aid of construction. And that's where you get to the amount that you can then allocate for growth versus existing. And we're, th and, I'm, and again, I'm going to say we're about 80 percent there. We did start over, but that was three months ago. When, when, Economist.com comes back with that number, that's not be, their job. We will not their job. Your job is to tell us the growth of what it's going to affect if we raise the impact fee. You need the number from us before you can say no, what it's going to do to grow. Your no, job is not economy. to tell us what the growth, yeah, what the number should be at. Carlos? No, not what it should be at. Provide information. Information. What it would do to our economy. Include number or numbers. This is what Absolutely. it could mean. This is what it could do. This is what it could not do. That's, That's what it. it's supposed to do. The, the way the law reads, uh, it's my job to provide you with the maximum fee net of the credit and then talk about the implications of, implement, of implementing that fee. This, this body then provides written comments to the commission to act on. How, how do you, okay, hold, hold on. Uh, Mr. Yes. Nard's been standing up. Yes, there. Jeff covered part of what I was going to comment on related to what the scope of work is and what we're hoping to get from him. One of the things I want to keep uh, in front of us is the amount of CIP that we are currently have in place that creates the $3,090 does not solve the problems of the rate payer having to have deal with an increased rate. We will have an increased rate because that's right now that's the way we're planning on dealing with it. Well, because that's not what this city commission is asking you to do. This city commission is asking this kayak to go get us a number, go get us a figure where we don't have to raise the rate. I don't want to raise the rate as a city commissioner sitting up here and as a, a person that appoints people to the kayak, I'm looking for a number. This is me. I'm not, I'm not going to speak to the rest I'm of the on city your team I, I'm saying that based on what we understand the law is, 3,090 still, if you went to the maximum. It's, it's still not, not enough. Oh, it's not enough. Correct. I'm saying that there are alternatives that I'm hoping that we'll get into after we've clarified and fine-tuned the numbers, make sure that we don't need to recreate the wheel on the study, that then we want to talk to you about some other public finance alternative that nobody's wanted to talk about in this whole group so far. And so what I'm asking you to do is let us fine tune, let us finish this part of the analysis to understand, is that number real? Did they forget some big things like life cycle of cost of, of, of operating a new $25 million plant? Those kinds of things we didn't talk about uh, through the times of study with the, uh, with uh, going through the process. So what I'm asking you to do is let us uh, in encouraging us to get to what Jeff is to bring into the table for us that will give us all better information and then I want to talk about some alternative public finance vehicles. Thank you. You know a lot of this stuff was 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 part of the process we went through most of you were not privy to it but Mrs. Greer and, and Chairman Vela and Mr. Bernard were. We talked about zonal rates. I mean it's something it's like it's not like we didn't talk about it. We talked about it and debated them. In fact, I'm the one that proposed zonal rates, a lower rate for urban than, than new growth, and it was rejected. That's the process, okay? That was made a decision, and we moved on. We also talked about ESUs, and I'm the one that pointed out that they were too optimistic, and the response was that if we lower the ESUs, the impact fee is going to go up. It's going to be more costly. But we also talked, as a committee, as a committee, we discussed it. We you also talked about. You keep saying that you did this and somebody else did that, but no. No, as a committee, we discussed it, and I raised the issue about Leanne. Am I wrong about the about the zonal rates? When was that, Mr. Mar? When we, we 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 did a kayak. We, you charged us to do the job. Yeah. Okay. And we, as a committee, we have a right to ask questions, like Mr. Capriano said, and propose alternatives. And we're ignorant of a lot of things. We came in there not knowing like some of our new that members. That would have been a great idea. The first time I heard of it was when Mayor Trevino but, brought, but, brought but, that but, up. But, but, but it was open to the public. You were welcome to come, okay? Yeah, Ms. Greer, am I wrong? Did I not raise the zonal rates? I never heard okay. that. Okay, I mean, we also raised yeah. the debt. We also raised the debt. So those things were, were taken into account. And 
you know, I think uh, uh, the charge was after we met, after we met, okay, it was very specific, no rate increases. Right. Is that right, Leanne? Okay, no rate increases from this body. I think it was unanimous. So and then the, the, the decision has to be made, how much growth do we want? If we're going to have no rate increases, and then how are we going to pay for that growth? And it's got to be a balance of rate payers and developers to keep the rates down. So if you gave us, and I, I got up here and I said it several times, if you give us $500 as an impact fee, or $1,000, or whatever number you give us, then we decide how much we're going to grow, how much we're going to build capital improvements. And I think that's what we need. We need the number to decide, hey, we don't want 125 million, 24 million. We want 30 million, based on that number, because that number is going to tell us how much growth we're going to allow, and how much, uh, how we're going to keep the rates from going up? I think that's that's the answer. Give us a number, and I don't think this is going to solve the problem because unless you want kill growth, you say don't do the capital improvements or do a portion of it, and you'll kill a portion of the growth. Uh, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, I want to disagree with Mr. Almada's comments regarding the kayaks uh, discussion of uh, increasing rates or lowering rates. We, we w that's not what we were there for. The kayak ha has a very specific charge, and it has nothing to do with, with are we going to be able to lower rates because of the impact fee or raise rates. That's what he just got through saying. We didn't discuss that because that's not the charge that this committee has. We already met as a committee, and we made the recommendations. And there was a recommendation. We didn't say this rate. Uh, no, wait a minute. It was you a committee that decided. You did not make a decided. recommendation. You you did not make no. a recommendation. No recommendation was the ever made. The kayak made a calculation. Right. That's right. Do we you agree on that? You keep using the word recommendation, we Mr. Armada. The $3,090 figure was not a recommendation a from Black and Beach, and it was not a recommendation from the kayak to the city commission. And yet, you continue to use the word recommendation. And I wish you would stop doing that because that is not what has happened. You are misinforming the public when you use the word recommendation. Did you all sign off on it? Mr. Armada, hold Did on you a sign off on it? I, I think we agreed. Did you on. sign off on it or not? Hey, did, did you sign off on it? And you remember, Mayor, right. I quite right. right. wait. 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 Yes, you did, Wait. You Or was it a recommendation? It was a calculation. Okay, Thank that's, you. That's the body, the body did not recommend. Yeah, did not recommend. Right. Okay. We but we said, Mr. Mata, look. <laughs> Let's go to page eight. No. Jump. We'll go back to Mr. Snowden's uh, presentation. Right, did anybody eight. order pizza? <laughs> <laughs> he says uh, pepperoni and cheese. <laughs> no, we're good. We're good. Everybody calm down, including me so every we need to get through this information the whole point of this is to get information and you know what if the number comes back and it's it's larger and you recommend that I'm gonna feel a lot better about it I don't care what the number is to be honest with you I want to make sure that it's a well based informed decision so that we do not make a that mistake we know the and if you say Mr. Snowden based upon your experience based upon your calculations you know what the number including debt ought to be five thousand and that's a number that you don't think that's is going to hurt it. growth, I know I'm going to feel better about it. And at least the commission should also. Oh. And if it's 2,000 or one, whatever that number is, let's get I all the information that. to make I an informed that. decision. This is not to help or hinder. Mm -hmm. It's just to make sure that we do not kill growth, but we do it in the right way. And guess what? We're going to make somebody upset whatever number it is. We're used to it. So. Okay. All right, go ahead, Jeff. Yes, sir. Um, just in terms of quickly trends and national impact <laughs> fees, uh, you can see that they are used increasingly nationwide to help recover the cost of growth. Uh, this next slide shows uh, national impact fee averages, selected cities in the state of Texas that are non-valley entities, and then valley averages. And what you can see is the valley is starting to implement impact fees. They're certainly behind the state average, 
but they are escalating, and uh, it, it's understandable when you when you look at the rates of growth in the valley and on the border as a region. So, that, oh, real quick. We've been having, up until a few minutes ago, we are having a fair discussion. If somebody wants to ask a question, I'll recognize you and I'll do it. Otherwise, we're gonna continue to be running over everybody. You have a question, Commissioner? Yes, All right, go ahead. Well, in 2006, it says the ni national average is 5,259. Yes, sir. The state of Texas average is 3,060. That's uh, the non-Valley entity average. Well, yeah, but, yes. but if you compare it to the Valley average, which is 983, you're comparing Brownsville to La Guya, little little cities. We're like a corporate city. Like the ones up on top, they're all paying five, four, three thousand dollar impact fees. You know, when we recommended 2133, I think uh, Sala Royal hit it right on the head. No, and we got there. But you know, if it wasn't for Commissioner Hernandez who rescinded it back to 280, which is costing, hold on, let me finish, because no, no. it did no. happen, do, it did happen. This you commission acts that. as a body, okay? Whether you want to accept it or not, don't take any more cheap well, shots. This is not a political forum. This is our business as a governmental well, entity. The thing is that I do talk to him and he makes it again. Do you understand the difference, sir? Well, maybe I don't. I know you don't. That's why I have to keep bringing you, your attention okay. to it. Now, please, your question is what? Why we still have it at 280 when the rest of the state and the nation are at five thousand dollars? That's what that's we're my on. question. Because we haven't looked at this that's for why we're doing years. This. Uh, it was looked at 2005. It was looked at in 1990. We don't say that. Okay. We've been looking in 2006 too. All right. Yes, sir. I was privy to this before we. Go ahead, Pat. I'm sorry. You got to talk on the mic, man. In all fairness, it's important for purpose of clarity because if not, it gets confusing. Some of these rates don't take into account fees that are not not called impact fees. Is that right, Mr. Zorg? That's right, Mr. So I mean, just because you see a table there with a figure, that doesn't mean that that's the impact fee because they call them something else. But he's right as far as comparable cities. Some are smaller, and their growth is different, and their capital improvements is different. So what drives the, the rate is the amount of growth and the amount of capital improvements. That's what drives the rate. Let's, let's so it's not. So we get through as much of this presentation. Yes, sir. Because I know I want to get home before breakfast. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we could have screened it by population size, but we chose to narrow the focus on border communities just to show that uh, the implementation of impact fees has not kept pace with the rest of the state. But it, it, it certainly is increasing, and we, we forecast that it will. And for example, in low com income communities in Arizona, we've got a combined impact fees of $4,500, $5,500. So. California is way, yeah, of course, there's not many. Yeah. You can see how they skew the average. Uh, on the land use assumptions, I'm running through this. Uh, this is the 1989 recorded land uses. Uh, which we looked at, you've got 97,000 acres in the PUB service area. We don't forecast where you, where you will consume all of that acreage in the near future, so that's not a big issue. Um, we have some bullets here that indicate what a fully developed land use plan would provide to you. And uh, I'm moving on from there because I want to get to the capital improvement plan. It's the single most important element of an impact fee study. And if we are revising downward the $134 million that's been filed of record, and certainly by 395, the $3,090 maximum impact fee goes away because that's the quotient and the numerator has changed. So I want to make get that clear. But remember again that once impact fees fund some or all of construction costs, rate revenue pays for the operations. Thus, to the extent that you choose to overbuild, rate payers will bear the long-term financial burden. And it is critical for all the parties to reach consensus on the required CIP. Um, how do you design a capital improvement plan per Chapter 395? Well, they talk about it in detail. You identify the facility expansions for which impact fees may be assessed. You describe each capital improvement and the cost of each one. You analyze the total current capacity and level of usage. You describe capital improvements necessitated by and attributable to new development. You include a table establishing current uses per unit charge. Per, for each category of capital improvement, 
you forecast out the number of service units and you include a plan for awarding a fee. Now, I'm going to jump off for a minute because I'm really trying to get after this data. What specifically, when I look at your system, what's your current capacity? What do you propose to build? A line item that says expand 22 lift stations doesn't tell me what I need to know to incorporate that in impact fee. I need to, need, need to know how many, what the total capacity of those lift stations are today and how much they will be post improvement in order to incorporate. So basically, you have to go back to PUB, right, and get information sure. from them. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, and here's some excerpts from the one y'all did in 1990. Now, this is kind of hard to read, but every, all, every bit of detail I'm asking for now was asked of uh, PUB in 1990 and supplied to the contractor. I'm asking for the same thing. This is in your 1990 RW Beck study. No. Based on the way that economist.com does an impact fee, which is consistent with 395 and with your 1990 contractor, yes. I'm not going to sit up here and say that the national firm didn't do it correctly. I, I don't really know. I think it might have a lot to do with the disclaimer on page two of their study. I don't, I couldn't tell you. It's a full page and it's basically, it's, we got a lot of our data from PUB. Uh, but anyway, this is what I'm looking for. This stuff, and then here's another thing: lift stations. What's your current capacity of lift stations? How much are you going to add to it? Well, we don't know. Well, here, here's 19, here's 2002 lift station inventory. There's 95 lift stations here, and they give you the gallon per minute of every one of them, rated horsepower, etc. That's what I'm looking for to complete this study. And there's no mystery. It was compiled in 2002. I'm sure it can be compiled now. That's what we need. Um, there's more on the impact on the capital improvement plan, but I'm going to move on. This is your CIP for water, which we just discussed, and it looks like some of this will be eliminated. Uh, but at this point in time, there was a $30 million CIP for water, of which 26.7 was for transmission and distribution lines. All of that came from a 2002 Turner Collier and Braden study, which was updated periodically, most recently November of 2006. And the big thing to, to consider on those updates is that those figures for, for consumption and flow were based on characteristics demonstrated in the PUB system in the late 90s and early 90s. Since that time period, you've had consumption demand drop by 30%. People don't get billed for 12,000 gallons a month anymore in the system. They get billed for 8,000 gallons. They use a lot less water than they did 10 years ago. And when you're going to plan out future capacity, 395 states, you've got to use current trends, not trends that are 15 years old. And that's really going to be the basis for a lot of the overcapacity statements that I make going forward and the, and the basis for the fact that a lot of the capacity you've got on the ground that the ratepayers are already paying for, you can recover through an impact fee and not have to build more stuff and operate and maintain it at the expense of ratepayers. Um, I'm going to go on. Wastewater, again, $53 million, of which $25 million is treatment, that's the plant, $28 million is pumping, those are the lift stations. And here's the description of the lift stations. Lift station number four, Boca Chica, new North Brownsville lift station, reroute, pump replacement, et cetera. No mention of current capacity or capacity when they get done with these improvements. Got to have it. We talk about Service units, this is your water connection and ESU history. You can see here that I'm going to jump to the punchline. You've grown by about 4%. Pointing out the plan. What slide number was that? 17. Great. Okay. This is your history from 1990 to February 2007 of new service units. Both connections and new service. You see the difference? You got 47,000 connections versus uh, 52,000 service units. That's basically the, if you apply an inflator of 20%, you go from connection to service units. That's the difference, more or less. 
So if you look at the history of the system, you've grown by, on average, 4% per annum over the last 17 years. Some years a little lower, some a little higher. For planning purposes, 4% seems like a reasonable number. Same story on the wastewater. You've added about new connections and ESUs at a rate of about 4% per annum. Uh, looking at your history of water intake, production, and sales, this is what I alluded to earlier. If you look at treated water, look at 1992 and 93. Let me see here. I'm going to do a pointer. 1992, 93, your average connection needed 626 gallons a day of treated water capacity. Fast forward to this lat of October of 06, that was down to 432 gallons a day. That's a 31% decline in consumption. Why? Well, I think there's several reasons. Higher efficient appliances and fixtures and rates. Price elasticity of water demand. The more you charge, the less people use. People have adjusted their consumption downward tremendously. And if you look at where they're at now, they, they come in right at 8,000 gallons. And that's right under the 9,000 gallon level where the rate increases really jump. So people have reacted to the rate increases. And uh, it's uh, justifiable. And you need to plan according to today's consumption trends and not trends that were prevalent 10 years ago. Um, you can see that this trend is also borne out not only in, in the treated water, but in the raw water taken into the plant and the, the amount of sales, the revenue collected. Same story on the wastewater treatment and billing history. I jumped to this slide earlier because this addresses the whole notion of uh, max capacity at the South Plant versus Robindale. And uh, you can see here again, I've only got four years data here, but uh, in, 90, in 2003, on average, you needed 406 gallons per day of sewage treatment capacity. That's declined to 319 in the most recent fiscal year. So the same issue applied to the wastewater. People, because of higher rates, I believe, uh, have adjusted consumption. And by the way, when you see that it applies equally to wastewater, that means they've not only adjusted consumption for irrigation purposes, because that water never hits sewage. They've, a lot of it occurs has occurred indoors. So one, one could argue that people are bathing less and going to the restroom less, <laughs> or, or holding it longer. Or I mean, arguably that's... Or fixing leaky toilets. There you go. And uh, aerating faucet heads okay. on. Yes, sir. Not going as often. Water yeah, low flow. Low, uh, 1.6 gallon for flush toilets, absolutely. This is your history of rate increases, and the, the main thing to observe is that once you get over 9,000 gallons, that's where the severity of the rate increases have really hit, and that's why people have adjusted and they're consuming eight. Um, on the rate hist on the revenue <coughs> history, you see about an eight and a half percent increase. Uh, you went from 2001 to collecting 27.2 million in rate revenue to collecting almost 41 in the most recent fiscal year. So you certainly, even though you've had declining consumption. The effect of the rate increases and in new accounts, adding at 4% a year, has resulted in uh, about a 9% per annum growth in revenues. Strong system, strong revenue growth is how we classify it. This is a big summary of your debt. The main thing to remember to focus on here is that you got $131 million of total water and wastewater debt. This includes the southmost debt. The next slide shows your annual debt service. This is very hard to read, but the point I want to make here is for the next 12 years, your debt service is going to be between 9.6 and $10 million a year. You don't have any year, any time frame up in the near future where you're going to wipe out debt and free up a bunch of cash flow. You've got a pretty fixed debt service arising for the next 12 years. So when we start looking at CIP funding and trying to be rate neutral with our current rate pairs, we can't count on the liquidation of a big chunk of debt in the next 12 years. And that's something that you want to incorporate in your decision process. Go ahead. Mike, repeat the step to the mic. Mike, step to the mic. I guess the, the question I have there is is the following uh, on that south, uh, south plant. Uh, the debt that we have is incurred by overbuilding. That's my question. Is, it, is the debt incurred by overbuilding and, and because I noticed on the other slide that you had on, and I'm going to go back to that page. Uh, on page 22, uh, it shows that we're about 45% capacity to the size of that plant. But then you show us a slide of the debt, 
and the debt is high. Is it due to that? Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't answer the question. I think this that, is just the total of all the. Yeah, it, it depends on the the, spe the financing specific to the 12.8 MGD at the South Plant, which I'm not aware of. I, I'm not sure how much of that was cash funded versus debt. Okay. But certainly, your current level of outstanding debt directly correlates to the amount of overcapacity on the system. I, I think, and in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, up until recently, all PUB debt was, uh, there was no, uh, it was 100 percent. Leandro, up until about two years ago, all debt that we were borrowing was at 100 percent. Well, no, I, no, no, that's, no, that's, no, that's right. No, 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 that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. No, that's, that's not right, that's not right. Confusing. Thank you. Forget it. Strike that. So, real quick, Jeff, for yes, this sir. this uh, this chart. Which one? This one we're looking at up there. Brown. Because I can't really read the. the would you say besides Los Fresnos, Rio Hondo, Brownsville pays the highest water wastewater rates? For 5,000 gallons of consumption, Mr. Atkins, Commissioner Atkinson, that's correct. It's also the case at 10,000 gallons in the next slide. Wow. Um, uh, it's also, when you look at commercial consumption rates or rate levels, um, you can see that you're toward the highest third uh, quartile. And that's, be, that's, that's above the state of Texas average, right? Uh, yes. You're just below on this one. No, on the first example. two, on the 5,000 and the 10,000, which everybody normally uses about 10,000. Yeah. We are higher than the state exactly. average, right? Yeah. McAllen, by the way, yes, sir. And uh, McAllen, Mr. Mata is the is the lowest on the rung here. Wow. So and they're five and we're sixty five. Well, on the fifty thousand. Okay, you want me to go back to the? Uh, yeah. Okay. I know the answer. Is About thirty five. Yes, sir. Yeah, I went, I went there, but yes, sir. And on the. We're sixty five and we're thirty five. And, and, and it's the same same issue at two hundred thousand gallons of your of your higher demand commercial. They were paying a rate that's toward the higher end of the spectrum. So. What, what I just to summarize then, you're generating strong cash flows and you've got rates that are higher relative to the peer group <coughs> and you've got growth. So you've got a lot of things that support a healthy system. Uh, one of the things raised was uh, how do our rates compare when we look at median household income? Our incomes are lower here. Well, we looked at that too and filtered that in. What are your average rates at a, as a percentage of median household income? Same story, you're toward the higher end of the rung. Your rate pairs for 10,000 gallons pay it right at 2.9% of median household income for water and wastewater. Now, that's interesting because when you get over 3%, that's when EPA and American Water Works say those rates are burdensome, let's kick in grant money. So for planning purposes, you want to keep that in mind as well. Um, Jeff, Jeff, yes, sir. If, if I may. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Just, to, just to, again, to understand this a little better, these rates are also fueled by O&M operations and maintenance. Oh, right? absolutely, yes, sir. So it, it's not just because of rate heights, because we want to raise rate heights. It's operations and maintenance that drive this also. Yes, right? um, that's correct. But you're going to have that anywhere. Yeah. Oh, point uh, taken. <laughs> but if we, do, <laughs> if we do expand, we will have more than what we have now. Well, these rates are going to be even higher if we adopt the 120. Exactly. Yeah, yes, sir. Well, I calculate they'd go up about 11 bucks from the 65 to about 76 to 77. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, in all fairness, again, all this could go out the window because as the mayor is well aware of. But if it goes out the window, well, the 3,000 goes let, with let, it, let, let, right? Let me, let me explain, let me explain. Okay. We're looking at, at building a 20 million gallon per day desal plant and we're looking and working on the Weir Dam, right, Mr. Mayor? So that will have a positive impact on our rates here. So I mean, all these projections, they're just projections, okay? Because we don't know what's gonna happen and how soon we're gonna build a desal plant depending on state funding. The factors that we're not in control of. But again, it goes back to what, as a body, elected body in the kayak committee, working, okay, with PUB and everybody else to adjust the rate depending on the cost. So those are positive things that could happen that would bring, bring the rates down. I don't know how you could construct a de uh, seawater desal plant, a 
and have lower rates? Well, no, we're getting we're getting we're getting funding from 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 the state, and we can sell we can sell water to other entities, which will bring revenues. Okay. Okay. So I mean, you know, those are things you're not privy to. Okay. So I mean, this study. Well, this, that, that, that's true, but that wouldn't. But that's also not included. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just saying, you know, for the purpose of discussion, those things could have a positive impact. But, but as of today, you're the third highest in water rates. Yeah. Um, we've been listening at home. Uh, Jeff. Hold on. Jeff, I had one question. Yes. Um, a while back, well, not a while back, but Mr. Gutz and I had a discussion. We talked about waste at PUB, and, and he's alluded to the fact on the operation, maintenance and operation. Have you seen our operation, our maintenance and operation PUB, and are things that are there ways and, and uh, to do things better to minimize the cost of MMA, the maintenance and operation at PUB? Are we efficient? Are we operating efficiently, or can we reduce some of that? Are there better mechanisms to do things better at PUB to lower that? I appreciate the, the question, Commissioner. I wasn't engaged to do a management study or an audit of any of uh, I have that can mix, answer that, but. Uh, and I, I appreciate the question, but I haven't come at it from that angle at all. That's really not even part of our repertoire. Uh, we do impact fees and rates, but we don't do management studies. I guess, I guess I'm just focusing on when we talked about maintenance and operation, we say this is a cost. I guess we need to also look at, at one point, how, how are we doing it in-house? How are we actually providing that and, and, and coming up with the number, whatever that number is? So, I, I mean, and I know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry that's not your your uh, objective here, but I guess that's that's something when we talk about waste. It, Commissioner, it is a, it's not part of my engagement, but I think that you would benefit from reviewing the management study performed recently for PUB, which uh, I'm sure you could access. Correct. If uh, it's your request, and that would probably address some of those questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. No. <laughs> um, so what we did, we, we talked about how to grow, what kind of scenarios we're going to look at, and we ended up providing four. The low end is Water Development Board. They forecast you're going to grow at 2% a year. The remaining three are the low, average, and high based on the 17 years history we looked at. I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the average, which is 4% per annum. Same for wastewater. The next step is to look at what you have on the ground currently. You got, I'm going to skip supply because that's addressed through the collection of water rights fees. Treatment capacity, you've got 46.97. That's your share of southmost plus your 240, 220s. Um, pumping, this is an estimate. I really need to tighten this up with a group. 75.5 million gallons a day of high service pumping capacity. Ground storage, 13.3. I know that needs to be updated. That comes from an official statement in 2005. Elevated storage is 5.5. I was watching you guys on public access the other night, and I know that, no, no, you guys, <laughs> you guys, and uh, y'all were awarding a contract for new 2MGD elevated storage plant. So that's being recognized. I need to update my numbers to, to uh, resolve that. Um, <coughs> transmission, I've got 40 MGD. That I would certainly want to work with Turner, Colleen, Braden, and tighten up. And we certainly want to net out any, any free money. Um, then we look at the capacity requirements are basically, what do you have now? What do you forecast to need over the next 10 years? Do you have enough to accommodate it? If you don't, what do you need? And then what does it cost? That defines how much we really need to build versus how much we need to look to and what you already have on the ground. And as we discussed earlier, to the extent that you can focus on what you already have on the ground, you negate new o &M, and you protect your ratepayers from increases. So can treatment, you say that again, please? to the extent that you're able to use your existing capacity to address the needs of growth, you don't bring new debt on the system and you don't bring new operation and maintenance costs on the system. And by not bringing those costs on the system, you don't ask your ratepayers to pay more to operate and maintain things you don't need because they're already operating and maintaining what you've got on the ground today. In this example, you don't need any treatment capacity for the next 10 years except for the most aggressive growth scenario. Um, pumping, I don't show where you need any pumping capacity over the next 10 years. Ground storage, I show where you do need some. And by the way, this is, there was no 
additional ground storage addressed in the CIP. So the whole notion that I'm trying to cut things out of the CIP just contradicts that. This is something that wasn't in the CIP that I'm saying you need. And how, how big of an impact does that have? This have? What savings? What savings would that bring us? We need a cost. If we, if we can figure out what it would cost to add six million gallons of ground storage, I can tell you what the impact would be. But that's that's the missing link. So would you request that information? No, sir. That, okay. That'd be the next step. Okay. Um, elevated storage. I show you only going to need about right four more. Four more. So for about four million gallons more of elevated storage, which probably going to be 2.2 because y'all are in the process of uh, adding two million gallons. Transmission, this is the big one. These are all the water mains that you're proposing to build. I show that you need about five and a half MGD of those. Um, this, in summary, supply and pumping capacity on hand appears to be adequate. Treatment appears to be adequate. Elevated ground and trans ground storage and transmission distribution capacity deficits are forecast and need to be addressed as part of the CIP and the impact fee. Next step would be to work with a group to own to true up the data that I've got, and make sure they agree, figure out what it would cost to resolve the deficits once everyone agreed on those deficits, and then allocate it to growth, and we're done with our water. Wastewater is the same issue in terms of growth. I'm a water development board was low and I got three others and I'm recommending the 4% for the group's consideration as a conservative estimate to plan based on. In terms of wastewater capacity, we've talked about this. You got 22.8 MGD on the ground currently of treatment capacity of which you're using 13. Lift stations, this I know is gonna change. This goes all the way back to 2002 when you had 97 lift stations with 100.6 million gallons a day of capacity. That's a peaked average ratio of 4.4, which doesn't mean a whole lot in this context, but that's the benchmark for pumping for lift stations. You've got to hit peak hour, peak day flows. Um, I really need to tighten that number up. I need a new inventory of the lift stations on the ground at PUB and the capacity of each one so we can figure it out. All of this, you're, you're telling us that you need all of this information. Have you since requested this information from PUB? We requested all this information the, w the week we were awarded this engagement. Has it been access to you? Have you have you had access to some of this? Has the, have you been receiving this information? I got about three quarters of it. Everything that I'm addressing today that I still need, I never received. Mr. Campirano, is there a problem with regards to trying to provide the additional information that Mr. Snowden needs? I mean, you, you, you guys have all the information. Can you speak up to the mic? Well, if he's 80% done and he's gotten three-fourths of the information, then we're pretty close. Right, exactly. A lot of the information he's requested, he's gotten. I think there's some things on there that still need to be worked on. He's mentioned TCB working with them. Um, uh, there are some updates that still need to be done. Uh, I mean, those numbers, I mean, I'm not the engineer, but I can tell you well, we have a lot more than 97 lift stations. And, 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 and he, 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 he said that. Yeah. Uh, I guess my, our, our request is that you please, so that he can finish this, please provide whatever additional information he needs in order to uh, to make his, uh, doing his analysis and do his calculations and what have you, finish his study. Again, I know we have some work to do, but I also think we need to have some work with Mr. Snowden to do as well. So, and, and this is the first, I, I guess from this point, forward we, we need to get together and, and do some stuff including uh, not only ourselves but obviously we've got a couple other third parties uh, whether it's Black and Beach or Turner Collie and Braden so <coughs> we will do that. Let me ask you something Jeff real quick. Yes sir. After you're done with this completely do y'all certify it or do you have to get PUB's acknowledgement? Do you have to sit down with PUB and acknowledge what you've come up with and get what, what they've given you come to consensus to where, because from what I understand, I was told at PUB that you're not certified to to sign off on this. Am I right or wrong? Well, uh, in terms of the engineer's stamp, that would would the engineer what? The, there's an engineer's stamp, PE stamp that uh, Black and Beach provided on their study. Uh, we we're not engineers, so we don't stamp a document. And. Uh, we but by the same token, it. Black and Beach couldn't stamp off on something that you would. Well, right, and uh, they wouldn't. I'm sure they wouldn't be willing to. Mm -hmm. And and 
We have certainly, we've tried to make contact numerous times with the gentleman at Black and Beach who did stamp the study, and we haven't had any success in that. No, sir. My understanding is he's no longer with Black and Beach. Oh, that's understandable. But you will be able to, Someone after else. this study is complete, you will sign off on this. <coughs> Absolutely, we'll sign off on this, and, 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 and I, don't, I can't think of one example where we ever came back before the body and said, here's our numbers, we disagree with the utility, these are our numbers. We're here to work with PUB and understand their positions and then reach a consensus on numbers all the way down to the smallest detail. And uh, if, to the extent that we show up to here in front of you guys and say we couldn't agree, that's a failure on our part because we're in the business to lay the issues out and uh, drum up an agreement. And that's okay. what we need to do to get done. Mr. Model? I think, uh, again, w w we have to clearly understand where we're at. You need some information from PUB, and you're going to come up with a recommendation or whatever your recommendation is. But in order for us to comply with state uh, statute 395 and, and state law and all that stuff, we need the engineer stamp to submit in order to, uh, to do, fulfill the process. Okay. That's correct. So, 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 and so, if you did so it the same, let, let, in the same me, manner me, that you did it last time, you let, would use PUB stamp. Let me finish. Let me finish, please. So, if you take out the plant, that you talked about taking out the plant. Okay, how can we certify something that we disagree? With, our experts disagree with you. How can we? How can we? I mean, how are we going to do that? Because some of this is your opinion, also. Okay, that you, you, we don't need this, or we do need that. Um, I, I'm having a little trouble with that because you're asking somebody to certify your work which we may be disagreeing and also you're asking us to maybe go reconfigure what was already approved and done to meet your expectations reconfigure which I think mayor has to go back to the board because we charged and paid for pe uh, the study and all that stuff and it was approved by by, by uh, the board okay so some of these stuff that he's asking for if I understand right will require the engineers to reconfigure for you no. And, and I think that I've got a direct response to that specific example, and I think it's a good one. On the issue of uh, a wastewater treatment plant, a new footprint at 5 MGD, costing 5 bucks a gallon for $25 million uh, versus conveying the sewage from one plant to the other, I'd like to do the life cycle cost analysis, <coughs> and uh, if that indicates that the plant's the better option, we can come back to the committee and recommend that. If it indicates that it's not, but it's close, same thing. Let's give the committee the full information and let them make the decision on which option. <coughs> Absolutely, yes, sir. But that's my that's my I guess solution to that specific example on uh, five MGD of brand new capacity at five dollars a gallon. Which I've talked to about eight engineers on that all over the state who tell me that. <coughs> A new plant should cost between two and three bucks a gallon. So I, I'm still curious how you got to five. Yeah, I got the answer now. Not the okay. <laughs> I wish the experts were here. Yeah. But it's just not, it's unfair for you to yeah. quote numbers that they can't respond to. Or there, there's nobody to respond to. They may have a reason for it. Why? Yes, sir. All right, you're on page 43 of your. Yes, sir. Uh, just to the next steps, agree on the method on the method to review and agree on the key assumptions and metrics, which I've talked about. When we finalize the CIP, we'll, we'll complete the preliminary maximum impact fee calculations, which will in entail submitting as our deliverable a report, which is probably gonna be 50 to 60 pages long. This PowerPoint <coughs> slide is not our product. It's not what we're being paid to produce. We're gonna, be, we're gonna produce a full report where all these issues detailed in the narrative, all the tables reflected, and that's the deliverables. I want to make sure there's no confusion. This isn't what we, this is part of what we were compensated for, but certainly not the final deliverable. It's going to be a full out study. It'll be a, an exhilarating read, but that's, that's what we're going to provide. And uh, we'd like to next schedule a uh, workshop to go over those. Oh, let's findings. do one tomorrow. Jeff, <laughs> one of the things that you got to get with uh, PUB, is it to come up with what they plan to actually fund? <coughs> They don't plan to fund $128 million. Do you have to know that? Absolutely, yes, sir. So that would be one of the things that you would have to sit down with them and decide what they actually plan to fund. Why is that important? 
Well, it's important because when you draft a capital improvement plan, put it out for public review and comment, and then formally adopt it as a basis of your impact fee calculations, you can't, you can't then go back and cut out 75% of it and use the same impact fee that that was based on. So the impact fee calculation is a direct function of direct the capital function improvement of, plan. Direct of, function of the capital improvement plan, how much you plan to spend. That's right. Now, since the kayak is meeting, and if there are changes, those changes can be made to the CIP during, not necessarily what you're doing, Ms. Snowden, but during the kayak process. These meetings that they've been, <coughs> it, well, have been started going on again. Is that right? I think that, I think that uh, the way it would work ideally is for PUB and myself and their external support group to develop a new capital improvement plan that reflects some of the items we've discussed today, then approach the kayak with that modified CIP and very clear and direct data with respect to the capacity that it would provide and go in that manner as opposed to the kayak being responsible for it. It's certainly responsible no, right, for right, the right, adoption. Right, 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 right. What I'm saying is that that information can be brought to the kayak, yes, sir. which can then modify, not modify, or what have you with the CIP. Yes, sir. That's correct. But just to, to, to elaborate on what Mr. Cabrera said, even if you take some projects out, you may end up at the end of the day having a bigger number. That's correct. Absolutely correct. Of impact. Yeah. It, it, you may have bigger. You may have the same. You may have less. All of these factors are going to affect the calculation. But I, I can tell you one of the things that will result in a lower impact fee is a 10-year planning period versus a five-year. I mean, if you're, if you're considering adding 5 MGD of capacity to 22.8, you're only using 13. Would it make sense to divide that over 10 years of new growth versus five to reduce the Absolutely. Mr. Romano? Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Um, the allowable, I don't want to get into semantics. Yes, my, 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 wor my words. Remember, we're not debating. Okay, uh, recommend this allowable meant, what I meant by that, that if we wanted to do $84 million of, of, of uh, capital improvements, the allowable recommended rate in order to meet that was 3,090, okay? That can be, that was the recommended allowable. That was the uh, no maximum more, okay? calculated. But, but yeah, but, but it is the number. Calculated, but it, you, can't, you can't do 84 million if you don't have that income coming in to pay for it. That's, that's what I'm saying. But okay? even if we did the max, you still don't have 84 million. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but we can't fund, we can't do capital improvements if we're not collecting. That's what, that's, that's what I meant by that. Don't so disagree. that can be, that can be adjusted what I'm saying is this, whether it's 84 million or 60 million, he's going he's to make a recommendation no matter what you take out, okay? It's going to be the recommended also allowable, allowable, okay? Which will also be subject to adjusting how much growth we want to do and how, much, how we're going to fund that growth, okay? Is that right? You really define how much growth that is allowable when you adopt your land use assumptions. That's yeah. when you Which is what we did. Right. We, we, we came up with 124 million, 84 million, and, and the maximum 3,090 to allow us to, to, to well do Well, on that. the land use assumption side, Mr. Mata, you, as a body, you, you agreed that you would fund new capacity demands at a rate of 5% per annum. No, I understand Based that. Based on that, you went to CIP to right. figure out. But you can go down, you can go down, like it was suggested, 2,133. So then, we can't do the, PUB cannot do the capital improvements that was projected with the 3,090 with 2,133, so it would be less, right? Well, I, think, I think that answers his but question. If, but if you change it to 10 years, well, yeah, maybe now you, you may be able yeah, to you do more. Yeah, you change it, yeah, but you're changing it. What I'm saying is based on what we have, okay? And what well, Mr. Capitano was saying is this, that we can't do 124 million we don't have the money. We don't have the money. That's right. So that's what's going to drive what we do, the money, the money we get. But we so it's not that PV does not want to do the capital improvements. It's that we don't have the funding for it. You still can't do the calculation without knowing what that sum of money is, whether it's 84, 132, or 25, whatever that number is. We have to have a figure. That's right. We have to have a figure. So we're okay, we're I think. We can't do the 124 million. We know we can't do the 124 million unless we have an amount. 
If you have a less amount, then you cut back on the capital improvements. Or well, you but, raise but rates. Again, okay, Unless again, you want to raise rates. Unless even, you want to raise rates. Even, even if this commission in the future said we're not going to raise rates, yeah. but we went with the maximum for argument's sake of 30, uh, 3,090, we know that's going to generate, according to projections, X amount of dollars. So that's the number that PUB works with and says, okay, well, we're all going to have money to generate 47, I think is what the number came out to, right? 43, 47? 43. 43. So that's so the that's number they figure out, okay, we can build one plant and do these other. That's very, very important. Okay, Mr. Snowden, you're at the end of your I am. I was just, right? yes, Mr. Mayor, right, I was just going to say. I, 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 we've, okay, we've had a lot of questions. One more. Right. I just want to, just to be very clear and, and make everybody very clear, regardless, regardless if we adopt the maximum or we, wherever we go, there will still be rate increases. No. No? There will be, if, if you want to do everything, if the, if the amount is generated on. by the developer is not sufficient, and if you want to do a project, then there has to be additional funding. Rate increases would be one of those. The problem with the So be it. Until we get to the point where, you know, uh, the city commission or PUB have no choice if that's where we get to down the road. But so this is where Go we're ahead. <coughs> Wrap it Sum up. up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, this is an excerpt from the 1990 study done by R.W. Beck, which I commented on earlier. It was very well done. And this is a uh, sensitivity analysis of different impact fee options. If you adopt this amount of impact fee, here's what your rates will increase by as a percentage. This is part of our deliverable. We can get the remainder of the data we need. We can bring this information to you and let you, the kayak and the commission, make an informed decision as to, okay, maybe we need to add more capacity than the 10 years required due to the economies of scale or whatever reason. Are we willing to raise rates by 25 cents a month? for that, 50 cents, zero cents, we can provide you that data as part of our deliverable, and uh, we're looking forward to doing that. The more information you provide, the better de the decision better. we can make. Exactly. And, and I, would, I would classify that as my closing remarks, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Snowden. All right, first of all, uh, let me apologize to everybody for, for getting a little out of control, but this is what happens Good when government. people try to speak over one another. We've tried real hard not to do that. So I'll, let me extend my apologies to everybody, including Commissioner Atkinson. I apologize Thank to you all too, for being here. Unfortunately, this is not going to be the last meeting on this, but I, I certainly feel at least that we're making some progress in, in reaching a consensus. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a policy issue, not a political one. All right? Thank you all for being here with us this evening. This meeting is adjourned.